Hour 1 In the Pacific, Chinese amphibious invasion forces stream out of civilian and military ports along the eastern Chinese coast. The massive fleet is a mix of military and civilian ships, including commercial ferries with reinforced ramps to allow them to on and offload heavy military vehicles. This first wave of invaders is 35,000 strong, and many more tens of thousands of soldiers are waiting for their turn to make the 100-mile journey to Taiwan. Chinese frigates scour the waters of the Taiwan Strait on the hunt for American or Taiwanese submarines. A formal declaration of war against Taiwan is being declared as the ships cut through the waves, and though no declaration of war against the United States is prepared, it's fully expected that the United States will honor its commitment to defend Taiwan from invasion. Any sub in the Taiwan Strait that doesn't belong to the People's Liberation Army Navy will be considered hostile and fired upon. A world away, Russian forces staging out of Belarus and the Western Military District launch an offensive into the Baltic countries. The featureless, flat plains of Eastern Europe are perfect tank country and favor the attacker, with few natural features to build defenses on. Overhead, a barrage of missiles preempts the crossing of Russian troops into NATO territory. Hundreds of ballistic and cruise missiles fly across Eastern Europe, aimed at NATO airfields, supply depots, and troop staging areas. Aegis Ashore facilities and other anti-missile defenses begin to light up the sky with their own counterfire. The average success rate of missile defense systems averages between 50 and 60 percent, but that still means over 100 missiles find their targets, cratering airfields, destroying fuel depots, and killing hundreds on the ground. But NATO hasn't been blind to the buildup of military troops by Russia, and the moment the first wave of missile strikes are detected and still in the air, NATO responds accordingly. The skies are so crowded with missiles for a few minutes that it's unsafe for NATO or Russia's combat air patrols to operate in the region, and they take to low altitude for safety. NATO's missiles have better precision than Russia's missiles, but Russian missile defenses are slightly more effective than NATO's. In the Pacific, China launches nearly 600 missiles in the span of an hour, the largest missile barrage in human history. These missiles target Taiwan's military and civilian airfields, hangars, command and control nodes, and electric power plants. However, a significant number of them also target American air bases in Guam, Japan, and South Korea. American and Taiwanese missile defenses put up a brave fight, but the overwhelming fire is too much, and many of the missiles find their marks. Guam is cratered by ballistic missile strikes, and America's largest military base in the Pacific is temporarily knocked out of commission. Thousands die on the ground. Further missile attacks target American naval vessels operating in the Pacific. China has needed four months to prepare its amphibious assault fleet, giving the world plenty of time to prepare for the coming war. The U.S. now operates four carrier groups in the Pacific, with a fifth in reserve along the American West Coast. As American satellites detect the start of the Chinese attack, a warning is sent across the entire American Pacific fleet. The carriers now move at full speed, taking random and aggressive turns, all in an attempt to throw off the targeting of China's missiles. American cyber and electronic warfare operations, however, are already underway. Targeting China's recon and targeting assets, they succeed in degrading the accuracy of China's missiles, but the sheer number of them still makes them a serious threat. As the missiles re-enter the atmosphere at several thousand miles an hour, American missile defenses put up a wall of lead and steel, with escort cruisers knocking out Chinese missiles with their own SM-3 missiles. When the smoke clears, one American carrier has been sunk, two have been seriously damaged, the third has suffered only minor damage. Many of the carrier group escorts, however, are severely damaged or sunk. The U.S. Navy has just experienced the largest single-day loss of life in its history. Hour 2 On the ground in Eastern Europe, Russian forces are making contact with the first line of NATO defenses. The NATO Rapid Response Force has dug in best as it can along the eastern flank of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. But the flat ground doesn't give much defensive advantage to NATO. NATO tanks are on the whole more modern and more capable than Russian tanks, thanks to crippling sanctions imposed on Russia after its annexation of Crimea in 2014 and additional sanctions in 2022 after its invasion of Ukraine. Other than destroying the Russian economy, the blockade of computer chips from major manufacturers such as Taiwan have been a devastating blow to a military already suffering from worn-out and poorly maintained equipment. This has had a cascading effect across the Russian military, as much of the smart tech of modern militaries relies heavily on computer components, which Russia is now forced to manufacture domestically. Everything from modern anti-tank missiles to air-to-air -air missiles and even fire control radar have a limited reserve supply and must be applied judiciously. The T-72 still makes the bulk of Russian forces, though in preparation for war several thousand Cold War-era tanks have been activated. These tanks suffer from serious deficiencies against modern weapons and are largely used as cannon fodder by the Russians. Scores of T-55s, T-62s, and T-64s smash into NATO defenses, soaking up anti-tank fire 
while more modern T-72s, T-80s, and T-90s mop up exhausted defenders. Casualties are horrendous for the Russians, but they have plenty of outdated equipment to throw into the fight. NATO's tanks are far more capable than most Russian tanks, but they're also more expensive and significantly fewer in number. The United States is still in the process of shipping the bulk of its armored forces to Europe, but it'll be several weeks yet before significant amounts of American armor is ready for combat. For now, Europe must hold the line long enough for the US to bring its full firepower into the fight, assisted of course by a few thousand advanced American forces stationed in Europe. Combat in the air is just as intense on the ground. Within minutes of the war's start, both sides' air forces took to the skies. Russian MiGs are capable aircraft, but again facing serious modernity problems from a lack of funding. However, while the Russian army has a reputation earned in Ukraine for poor tactics, communications, and performance, the Russian Air Force remains a competent and credible threat to NATO. Both sides are unable to bring the full power of their air forces to bear against each other. For NATO planes, the threat comes from Russia's numerous air defense batteries, which operate close to the front lines and can even threaten NATO planes from within Russia's borders. The S-400 system ranks among the best air defense systems in the world and is lethal to NATO's fourth and four and a half generation fighters. At immediate and close range, numerous self-propelled air defense guns shore up S-400 and older S-300 defenses. NATO, on the other hand, relies heavily on fighters and interceptors for air defense, whom themselves are at risk from Russian ground-based defenses. However, NATO enjoys one distinct advantage over Russia, the F-35 stealth fighter and America's fleet of F-22 air supremacy fighters. Unfortunately, only a few hundred F-35s are capable of combat operations across the NATO alliance, and most of these are from the United States. The vaunted F-22, the most capable air supremacy fighter in the world, is also in very low numbers, and most of them are being diverted to bases in the Pacific for sea and air war against China. Entire fleets of American aircraft are already making the Atlantic crossing with the aid of tanker planes, but it'll be a day or two yet before they're ready for combat ops. Europe's lack of stealth fighters means they can't safely operate near the front lines, temporarily giving the air advantage to Russia. Russia presses that advantage as best it can, but carrying out strike missions over the front lines is still hazardous business for its air force. Russian bombers devastate NATO defenses, but take casualties of their own. Long-range standoff attacks via air-launched cruise missiles keep Russian pilots out of harm's way. NATO responds with its own long-range strikes, but for now the air over the front belongs to Russia. Attack helicopters from both sides fight ground defenses and each other all across the front. It'll take time yet for NATO to gather its forces, and the numbers advantage is once more in Russia's favor. Still, both sides suffer heavy losses of air cavalry to man portable air defense weapons and traditional air defenses both. As the second hour of World War III comes to a close, a massive offensive out of the military enclave of Kaliningrad pushes into NATO defenses in southern Lithuania. Further cruise and ballistic missile attacks rain out of Kaliningrad and into it from NATO return fire. The overwhelming amount of NATO firepower aimed at Kaliningrad quickly shuts down any hope of conducting air operations out of the enclave, but it's still a strong point of tens of thousands of Russian troops in armor who are manning defenses along the Polish border while a separate thrust north into Lithuania seeks to destroy NATO forces there. Russia's hope is to sever NATO from the Baltic countries, and there's little the alliance can do to prevent that at the moment. Hour 3 In the Pacific, the Chinese Navy has begun the bombardment of the Pengu Islands, silencing naval defenses there. The massive amphibious assault force has crossed most of the Taiwan Strait, and the island fortress nation is now in sight. Overhead, Chinese fighters battle Taiwan's rapidly diminishing air force for supremacy while other strike aircraft carry out SEAD operations, or suppression of enemy air defenses. Taiwan is equipped with very robust air defenses courtesy of America, and they take a heavy toll on the Chinese aircraft. China has over 2,000 combat aircraft, however, and is easily able to absorb the punishment. Lurking under the waves, though, the Chinese fleet runs into a coordinated Taiwanese and American ambush. U.S. and Taiwanese subs have been powered down, lurking silently and awaiting the fleet's approach, and now, with the lead ships in range, they begin to open up on the Chinese Navy. Each submarine acts independently, but with attacks coming from multiple directions, there's little the Chinese ships can do to avoid destruction. Chinese anti-submarine warfare aircraft have been patrolling the strait for hours now, but the Chinese Navy's anti-submarine warfare capabilities have serious deficiencies. Their biggest problem, though, is that they're up against American Virginia-class submarines and Taiwan's electric diesel boats, both extremely quiet. Multiple Chinese vessels are sunk or heavily damaged, and in the chaos, the invasion fleet spreads so as to avoid becoming an easy target. 
and that's when they run into hundreds of anti-ship mines deployed in advance by the Taiwanese Navy. The cost to the Chinese Navy is staggering, a satisfying payback for the losses the US Navy suffered during China's ballistic missile barrage. But the sheer number of Chinese vessels means the invasion will carry on. Exposed by their attacks, the submarines make for a quick exit from the strait. They won't all make it, as Chinese destroyers and ASW aircraft score several hits. Hour 4 The air battle over Eastern Europe intensifies as both sides continue carrying SEAD operations against each other. For NATO, establishing air dominance is of critical importance as it's the best way to support outnumbered troops on the ground. Keeping NATO aircraft off the front is just as important for the Russian military to ensure the success of their ground forces. Without air superiority, the advantage is in the Russians' hands. Knowing that they couldn't guarantee the safety of strike aircraft against NATO's technologically advanced military, Russia has placed a focus on ground fire support platforms over air platforms. Russia's infantry is typically supported by far greater amounts of artillery than a comparable NATO unit, allowing them to bring far greater amounts of firepower to support their advance. In an environment currently lethal to strike aircraft, this gives Russia a sizable advantage at the front. However, this strategy also comes with serious limitations. Russia's forces are unable to exploit openings in the enemy's defenses for fear of outrunning their ground-based fire support and air defenses. As NATO forces reel from the Russian assault and fall back, NATO warplanes patiently wait for any Russian forces foolish enough to advance too quickly for their air defenses to protect. The Ukrainian war highlighted serious command and control issues for the Russian military, and while steps have been taken to correct the problem, Russian forces facing full-on electronic warfare from NATO and often out of contact with leadership for long periods of time occasionally move out of step with the rest of the advance. Those that do are immediately pounced on by NATO ground strike aircraft, who circle behind the front lines like hungry sharks. The bulk of the Russian force, however, maintains operational integrity and moves at a predetermined maximum advance rate so as to keep under the protection of their ground-based fire support and air defenses. This makes their advance slow and predictable though, a fact that the vastly outnumbered NATO forces take full advantage of. Heavily damaged NATO units are able to withdraw and avoid full destruction, allowing them to regroup and redeploy. However, NATO has its own issues. Russian electronic warfare capabilities are wreaking havoc on NATO communications, and the fact that the alliance speaks over two dozen different languages creates great difficulty coordinating the various components of the NATO Defense Force. English and French are the official languages of NATO, and most senior officers know one or both of them to ensure continuity of operations. But as communications are degraded and casualties mount, a lack of understanding makes it difficult for smaller units to operate together on the battlefield. The alliance is reeling from the onslaught and slowly but steadily losing ground. In the Pacific, American air power is yet to make an entry into the fight over Taiwan. Runways across South Korea, Japan, and even the Philippines face ongoing strikes from long-range Chinese missiles. The attacks have largely grounded air forces in the region, but they've come at a high cost by galvanizing Japan to join the fight. South Korea maintains neutrality, despite attacks on two US bases in its country, and the death of some South Korean civilians and military personnel in the strikes. They are too preoccupied with a possible North Korean invasion instead. The Philippines remain similarly neutral, despite their defense pact with the United States. Wary of joining the US against China, countries all across the South Pacific are delaying their decisions on which side to back, as confidence in a US victory is shaken by the losses incurred by America in the opening hours of the conflict. There is growing doubt that the US will be able to effectively fight off the Chinese assault, as China's navy and rocket forces keep US forces at bay indefinitely. Backing the US now could have disastrous consequences in a new world order in the Pacific led by China. Australia, however, is fully committed to its mutual defense pact with the US, and its forces prepare for deployment into the South Pacific. However, neither Japan nor Australia undertake any major air operations against China, instead ensuring territorial integrity and patrolling against any Chinese aerial incursion. Despite fears China would attack disputed Japanese islands though, there is no attack as the nation's focus is strictly on its pending invasion of Taiwan. Hour 5 Shore-based defenses rain hell on a swarm of Chinese amphibious assault vessels. The battle for Taiwan is on. China has decided to hit three different beaches simultaneously, two in the north and one in the south of the island. Because of the difficult undersea geography and suitability of the island's coast, there are only a few beaches where an amphibious assault is possible, and Taiwan has invested billions in their defense. Chinese forces first hit Gold Beach, the code word for a landing site outside of Taoyuan City. Shore-based batteries and mobile artillery open up on the approaching landing craft. Missiles streak into the sky, targeting the amphibious assault ships and their escorts over a dozen miles offshore. 
Landing craft and amphibious vehicles are being sunk by the dozens before the first finally makes it to the beach. By the time the first Chinese soldier steps foot on the Taiwanese mainland, 600 of his compatriots have already been killed or drowned. He doesn't fare much better, almost immediately getting gunned down by a hidden machine gun nest. A barrage of grenades destroys landing craft and all the men inside it. But there's many more landing craft coming. Gradually, the lead elements of the assault make successful landfall, but as the bulk of the assault force crosses an invisible line, the ocean suddenly erupts in flames. Hidden along the seafloor are long pipes through which the defenders pump raw oil. The oil floats to the surface before being set on fire, creating a raging inferno that floats along the top of the waves. The heat kills dozens of Chinese soldiers, even from inside the protection of their landing crafts. Large fan-powered landing ships carrying armored vehicles catch on fire and begin to sink as their rubber skirts deflate. The losses are horrendous, but still the assault keeps coming. Overhead, Chinese strike aircraft do what they can to neutralize the island's defenders, wiping out artillery positions with precision-guided weapons. However, many of these planes don't survive their attack run, blown out of the sky by Taiwan's robust air defenses. But the Chinese military has more planes than Taiwan has air defenses, and inevitably air defense sites are destroyed one by one through a combination of missile strikes and bombing runs. Taiwan's best defenses are its mobile defenses, self-propelled artillery and short-range air defense batteries. These prove difficult to track and pin down and are a deadly threat to scout aircraft trying to sniff them out. Taiwan's own air force rises to the occasion, but it's hopelessly outnumbered. Regardless, the island's defenders continue to put aircraft into the sky, operating from highways as most airfields in the country have now been damaged or effectively shut down. A half hour after the assault on Gold Beach begins, the Chinese open a second front directly north of Taipei. This assault meets with equally intense resistance, and huge Type 72 landing ships with bellies full of tanks and infantry fighting vehicles race to the beach. The second assault forces Taiwan to split its reserves as it rushes to ensure the Chinese can't gain a foothold, but Chinese airstrikes are making it difficult to quickly move troops around. A volley of missiles fly out from the beach and smash into the lead Type 72, causing massive damage to the ship and sinking it. The wrecked ship, heavily laden with troops and equipment, sinks quickly in the shallow water, and a second landing ship runs straight into the wreck, tearing its hull open. It too will sink in less than a minute, creating an artificial barrier for the ships. Regardless, though, more ships continue the assault and, despite the withering fire, manage to make it to the beach. Ramps at their front open and the Chinese tanks and IFVs begin to pour out, to immediately be met by a flurry of American-made Javelin anti-tank missiles. Reactive armor on the Chinese tanks tries to deflect the incoming warheads but are largely unsuccessful against many of the most sophisticated tank-killing weapons in the world, and the US has provided thousands to Taiwan in anticipation of this invasion. A dozen miles away, Chinese air assault forces zip toward the coast in assault helicopters. To avoid air defenses, the pilots are flying at just above wave top height in a daredevil sprint to get past the beaches. The moment they near land, though, they're forced to pull up to clear trees and buildings, which makes them easy targets for shoulder-fired air defense weapons. Numerous Chinese helicopters are blown out of the sky, but many make it to their destination. Public squares and large parking lots pre-designated as air assault zones before the invasion. Chinese troops rush to secure defensive positions and coordinate. Their job is to seize key infrastructure across the invasion front and put pressure on the defenders' flanks. Taiwan counters with its mobile reserves, specifically kept out of fighting for just this reason. At several landing sites, Chinese troops are slaughtered as they're quickly overwhelmed, but the Chinese air assault manages to hold on to a few of its landing zones. The surviving assault helicopter fleet is already well on its way to the mainland and amphibious assault ships offshore to pick up more reinforcements. Taiwan holds the beaches, but under intense air attack, they'll be unable to fend off the Chinese troops for long. Hour 6 Somewhere deep behind Russian lines, a series of explosions lights up the early morning sky. Critical air defense radar immediately goes offline. More explosions 30 miles away eliminate a Russian command post. Flying at tens of thousands of feet over war-torn Eastern Europe, two American B-2s secretly forward deployed to Europe make their way back to friendly lines. They've flown a zigzag course to their targets, always presenting their stealthiest side to enemy radar. Russian radar technicians picked up an intermittent contact of something, but were unable to provide a firing solution to air defenses. On the way back to friendly lines, though, the B-2s are slightly more visible to ground and airborne radar, and several interceptors are vectored in on their approximate location. As they near the B-2s, their radar struggle to get a weapons quality lock, as the B-2s take evasive action and defeat enemy radar by angling away from it. Still, it's only a matter of time before Russian MiGs have sniffed out the general location of the bombers and closed in enough that no amount of stealth technology can prevent a good lock. Suddenly, the lead MiG picks up a missile lock warning, 
Instinctively, he dives his plane, picking up speed and hoping to confuse the incoming missile with ground clutter. There's more warnings across the fleet of incoming interceptors as the MiGs attempt to scramble. The dividing MiGs desperately try to outmaneuver or outrun the incoming missiles, but the short detection range spells doom for many of the pilots. One by one, MiGs are blown out of the sky, with a few surviving and backing off the vulnerable B-2s. Somewhere in the dawn sky, a formation of American F-35s wheels to cover the B-2s retreat. They are some of the few operational F-35s NATO has in service, and though deadly to Russian air defenses, are too few in number to significantly alter the air war. The B-2s must also be used judiciously, as they too are few in number to significantly damage Russia's ability to fight. Hour 24 It's been one day since the start of the Third World War. The Sino-Russian alliance has pushed NATO back significantly in the Baltic states as America rushes to recall troops on leave and prepare to embark reinforcements to Europe. It'll take weeks for the US to be ready for ground operations. Even with the world's largest logistical fleet preparing around-the-clock flights to Europe, NATO is rushing to marshal a response force in Poland as the Polish military reinforces its defenses on its border with Russia, held Ukraine, and Kaliningrad. After a day of fierce fighting, it's not expected that NATO will hold on to its Baltic allies for long, though that was always expected. NATO navies have initiated a sting of anti-submarine defenses that stretch from Greenland to Iceland and to the UK to help safeguard US troop ships as the first rushed reinforcements begin to load onto ships on the US east and Gulf coasts. In the Baltic Sea, fierce fighting between NATO ships and the Russian Navy has kept Russian naval firepower at bay. As it has so often found itself throughout history, Russia is unable to put its fleets to sea, outnumbered and outgunned by superior NATO navies. French and Spanish aircraft carriers have moved into the Mediterranean and are steaming toward the Black Sea where the Turkish Navy has been securing the Bosphorus Strait and cutting it off to Russian trade. From the Black Sea, NATO ships can harass Russia's southern flank with long-range missiles and airstrikes, though they still face stiff defenses based out of Crimea. In the Pacific, the US Navy and Air Force have yet to stage a counterattack against Chinese forces. Ongoing missile attacks have kept the US fleet far out at sea and out of range of launching their own attacks. Losses continue to mount as Chinese land-based missile strikes seek out American ships or sink and cripple them. However, the number of missiles in the Chinese inventory is rapidly diminishing. On Taiwan, the first two beach assaults have failed, leading China to cancel their assaults. Over 5,000 Chinese soldiers lie dead on or just off of Taiwan's northern beaches. Chinese air assaults have met with similar failures, but thanks to fierce air support, two of the landing sites remain in Chinese control. It's cost the Chinese Air Force dearly, though, with over 50 aircraft destroyed in the first day of fighting alone. Across the island, Chinese special forces inserted secretly onto the island prior to the invasion have struck out at Taiwanese political and military leadership. Several prominent politicians are either under arrest or dead. Efforts to evacuate senior Taiwanese leadership to the mainland, where they can be used for propaganda purposes, have ended in failure and Taiwan's president remains out of grasp with Chinese kill teams. Rather than allow Taiwan to recapture officials, Chinese special forces execute them. Hour 48 Tankers have been escorting US fighter and bomber aircraft across the Pacific nonstop for the last two days. The bulk of the US air forces now are stationed in civilian and military airfields across Japan, as the Japanese self-defense forces successfully fend off the worst of China's continued but diminished missile attacks Losses to U.S. aircraft on the ground remain significant, but enough aircraft are operational to begin offensive operations. The Chinese fleet has reinitiated amphibious assaults against Taiwan under the cover of a vicious air campaign. Most of Taiwan's air defenses have been neutralized by now, including the majority of the Taiwanese Air Force. However, as the assault commences, Chinese airborne radar detects a massive air assault of F-15 and F-18s, backed up with multiple tankers and EWACs for support. The F-18s have been launched from the surviving Pacific Fleet carriers and ferried to their destination with the support of drone tankers. The US Air Force's F-15s have been flying for hours from Japanese air bases, accompanied by their Japanese allies. The US and Japanese tanker fleet has remained in orbit around the seas south of Japan, topping off the massive air fleet and ready to help fuel-starved combatants return home. The largest air battle of modern war is about to begin. Chinese interceptors move to defend the amphibious assault from both the northern and eastern air assault. China's lack of aircraft carriers forces the fighters to remain close to Taiwan's shore, which exposes them to surviving air defense units, forcing the Chinese to turn on afterburners and try to meet the American and Japanese forces out at sea. There's another reason for trying to close the distance as rapidly as possible, and it becomes apparent as the first missile lock warnings ring out across the cockpits of Chinese fighters. Stealthy F-22s and F-35s are leading the assault, launching new generation long-range air-to-air missiles at the Chinese jets. The result is dramatic, 
as Chinese fighters are forced to dive to try to juke off the American missiles. With two missiles fired at each hostel, many Chinese fighters fail to shake off the missiles and are splashed. But stealth fighters have one inherent weakness. They have a very low missile capacity due to the need to carry all weapons internally. Spent even before making visual contact, the F-22s are forced to turn around, but the F-35s press the attack. Their data link capabilities allow them to guide non-stealthy fighter weapons to targets, while keeping the vulnerable fourth-generation fighters away from the enemy jets. Another wave of missiles scream across the sky guided by F-35s that the Chinese are having difficulty picking up on radar. But the Chinese have an improved air-to-air -air missile with a range in excess of 200 miles, and they launch their own volleys back at the Americans and Japanese. They can't target the F-35s yet, but the F-18s and F-15s give off massive radar returns and are easy prey for the improved Chinese missiles. Friendly aircraft tumble out of the sky as the Chinese press into visual range of the attack. The F-35s immediately break off. They're not built for close quarters combat. The F-15s and F-18s, however, are. Chinese J-10s, J-16s, and Su-30s are fine aircraft, but the F-15 Fighting Eagle has proven it is the superior machine in conflicts around the world. For every F-15 downed, four enemy aircraft are splashed. The battle is far from decisive, but American and Japanese strike aircraft are able to penetrate Chinese air cover and deliver devastating blows to the assembled Chinese fleet. Air defenses have a difficult time taking out the attacking aircraft thanks to their use of long-range standoff attack munitions. Missile defenses, however, do their best to fend off the attack and succeed with a kill rate of about 60%. But many Chinese ships are still struck and either sunk or rendered combat ineffective. By the end of the second day of fighting, America has finally struck back in an inconclusive air battle that saw both sides take steep losses. Its fleet of stealthy F-22s and F-35s, however, remains largely intact, but it's feared that there are simply too few to carry on the fight. Conspicuously, China's Chengdu J-20 has yet to make an appearance on the battlefield. Despite the setback in the air, China has managed to secure a beachhead on Taiwan. Now the unloading of the massive Chinese army can begin, but Taiwanese resistance is far from broken. Over in Europe, NATO forces in the Baltic states are exhausted and overwhelmed, with many surrendering to the Russians. It'll be a few days yet, but Russia is on the verge of reclaiming lost Soviet territories. However, the war is far from over, and NATO will quickly be capable of launching massive ground assaults against Russia starting with Kaliningrad. Hour 72 Fierce fighting rages on in the major cities of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, but NATO's 40,000-strong response force has been neutralized by Russian forces. The cost has been steep. But with conventional forces largely defeated in the Baltics, the massive Russian war machine begins to swing south towards Kaliningrad, which has been decimated by ongoing missile attacks. The battle for the heart of Europe will commence in days, as NATO uses Poland as a staging ground for its counterattack. In the Pacific, U.S. losses of ships and aircraft are steep, and additional material from the U.S.'s other global commands is being rushed to the Pacific. However, Chinese losses are even steeper. In a race of attrition, China will ultimately lose. Hence, it's vital that Taiwan be captured as quickly as possible. U.S. forces, however, have begun a naval blockade of China, cutting it off from its naval trade routes. Sensing an opportunity to seriously weaken its regional rival, India joins in the blockade, sealing China off from importing the oil and natural gas it desperately needs. Land supply routes to Russia are still available, but the steep drop in supply causes energy prices to skyrocket. Like Russia discovered in Ukraine, Taiwanese resistance to hostile invaders is stiff and deadly. Chinese troops are engaged in fierce street fighting, with civilian militias taking up arms provided by the government against the invaders. The Taiwanese people have no desire to be a part of Xi Jinping's China, and they make the People's Liberation Army pay dearly for every inch of Taiwan they take. Hour 168 Across Chinese social media, images of the ghastly cost of the Taiwan invasion are being spread. Taiwanese and American cyber warfare agents have managed to penetrate the Chinese Great Firewall, and now photos and videos of the devastation in Taiwan are being spread faster than Chinese censors can stop it. The Chinese people have for generations been told that a conquest of Taiwan would be easy and bloodless, but the high cost in terms of human lives is now clear for all of China to see. The Chinese Communist Party has used the state media apparatus to lie about casualty figures, reporting only a trickle of casualties each day, hoping to keep the public outrage down. Anger and outrage quickly builds. In Europe, NATO's second response force has engaged Russian forces across the length of the Polish border. Russian air defense batteries have been greatly attrited through ongoing strikes against them, but the cost has been high for the pilots of Europe's air forces. American stealth aircraft are badly needed in the Pacific, and the job of suppressing Russian air defenses falls on Europe's largely non-stealth air force. The outcome of World War III will be decided in Poland and Taiwan. Hour 336 
Two weeks after the start of World War III, the momentum of the Russian war machine has begun to stall out in light of stiff and well-organized resistance by NATO forces. The invasion of Ukraine has proven that the much-feared Russian military juggernaut is a clumsy giant, defeated more by its own ineptitude than foreign military powers. While Western armies place a strong emphasis on logistics, Russian military forces have approximately 25% the logistics personnel of NATO militaries. This means massive convoys of Russian vehicles stuck on the side of roads and highways, starved of fuel and ammunition. Russian troops, especially its conscript forces, suffering from catastrophically low morale as they come under fire from advanced NATO weapon systems. Surrenders of entire units are growing increasingly common, and the high casualties are causing a massive political descent back home. Strong-handed police tactics against anti-war protesters can barely restrain the tide of malcontent sweeping across Russia, and Vladimir Putin's hold on power grows more tenuous by the day. While the Russian attack hasn't been repelled, it has been ground to a halt just inside Poland's borders. The arrival of a large American army unit on the continent marks the beginning of offensive operations for NATO, and the future looks grim for a Russian military suffering from bad equipment, low morale, and terrible logistics. The Russian Air Force, however, continues to perform well, though equipment and maintenance shortfalls have begun affecting it as well. Slowly but surely, European NATO forces have wrestled control of the skies away from Russia, and over the coming day, Russian frontline units will be exposed to the full wrath of NATO air support. In the Pacific, China has maintained its hold on the western half of Taiwan, but at a staggering cost. Over 15,000 Chinese troops are dead or wounded, but the Chinese Communist Party works hard to keep those figures hidden from an increasingly angry Chinese public. They were promised a swift victory over the tiny island, and that the United States could be defeated in the Pacific with China's advanced missiles and aircraft. Neither of these have proven true, and while the US has suffered massive losses of ships and planes, it's able to replenish losses faster than the Chinese Navy and Air Force. Taiwan's defenders have so far repelled China's attempts to push through the east of the island, and now American Marines are arriving in force. To the world's great surprise, US Marines are backed up by Japanese troops, who have revoked their pacifist constitution in the name of regional defense against an aggressive China. But it's not just the Japanese joining the US in defending Taiwan, as the Australians join America in defense of the Pacific. China alone in the region with no friends is now facing the monumental task of defeating three major powers simultaneously. As losses mount for the Sino-Russian alliance, both President Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin consider their final option. Nuclear power is the great equalizer, and the one way that Russia can overcome NATO's overmatch of its own military forces. But for every one strike that Russia or China may undertake, NATO will respond with two in an escalatory ladder that will end with the world in ashes. Russia's on the warpath, and if successful in Ukraine, is unlikely to stop there. Lithuania, with EU support, has shut off the flow of military and economic material to the Russian enclave of Kaliningrad, triggering a threat of invasion by Russia in retaliation. A world away, China flexes its muscles as it threatens the United States and their continued support for Taiwan. Fears of World War III are growing by the day, and the United States is taking them very, very seriously. Before we discuss how the US is preparing for the Third World War, first we need to know what its potential enemies are doing. China has long been preparing for a confrontation with the US as it seeks to become the world's dominant superpower. Currently, China falls short of the qualifications for a global superpower, qualifications which only the US fills at the moment. But with its dizzying economic and military growth, it might be less than a decade before the Chinese Communist Party can project power all over the world. China's preparations for a showdown with the West include dislodging the United States as the most important economic power in the world. It also has safeguards to its own economic interests in the wake of economic warfare versus the US. And to achieve this aim in 2013, it launched the Belt and Road Initiative. This massively ambitious plan included building new land and sea trade routes all over the world to connect China economically with nations all the way from Europe to Africa. To achieve this, the nation has not just invested in its own infrastructure, but in building trade infrastructure in other nations as well. However, China's partnership with host nations is more often than not extremely predatory. They offer economic loans to build massive projects that promise economic prosperity, like seaports and rail yards. However, the terms of those loans often dictate that Chinese companies must be hired to do the construction, leaving few jobs for locals. Interest rates on the debt traps is often so high that a poor third world nation is guaranteed to default. Included in the penalties for defaulting are clauses such as China owning exclusive rights to the infrastructure it builds for terms as long as a century. It is in effect a modern version of soft colonialism. 
China's plan is to have heavy influence in the trade of goods throughout Asia, the Middle East, and Africa, putting it in a very strong position to dictate geopolitics in its ever-growing sphere of influence. China's next preparation for war with the U.S. includes securing its vulnerable trade routes through the South China Sea and the very valuable oil and natural gas deposits in the region, as well as the remaining rich fishing grounds. This effort began with the construction of artificial islands in 2013, which continued unopposed despite an international ruling by the World Court in The Hague that such island building and claims to economic exclusion zones around them were illegal. Foreign pressure also failed to stop China from stealing claims to oil supplies by neighbors such as Vietnam, or of using its Coast Guard to bully and intimidate the merchant and fishing fleets of other nations out of their own territorial waters. These islands have now become heavily fortified military installations, which include modern missile defenses, runways long enough for long-range attack aircraft, and an ever-growing network of surveillance assets, all geared for one purpose – detect, track, and destroy the U.S. Navy. Further preparations have included the addition of dozens of new ships to the People's Liberation Navy, which is now officially the largest in the world. Recently, China's second aircraft carrier came online, and in a few years will be ready for battle, greatly enhancing the CCP's reach in all the important sea and air domains. With Russia's increased belligerence in Europe, there is a serious concern that the two nations might partner up in an attempt to turn the current US-led world order on its head. Despite China's increasing capabilities, it still does not have the power to defeat the US in a one-on-one -on -one confrontation, and it might hope to split the US attention by partnering with Russia, thus forcing America to choose fighting between China in the Pacific or Russia in Europe. For decades, the United States maintained a policy of fielding a powerful enough military to fight and win two simultaneous wars against near-peer adversaries. However, with China's rapid ascension, this has become officially impossible without bankrupting the US, and thus America has been forced to accept that it may only be able to defeat one near-peer adversary at a time. The question is, how was the US preparing to do that, given the increasing likelihood of China and Russia starting a third world war? First, the situation in the Pacific might seem dire with China's numerically superior navy, but the real measure of naval power is not the number of vessels, but in the number of battle force missiles. These are the number of missiles that both navies can bring to bear against each other. The US maintains around 10,000 missiles versus the PLAN's estimated 2,000. Though those numbers have changed and will continue to change as China fields larger vessels and both navies shift in composition. It's estimated that by 2030, China might have closed the gap in battle force missiles to two-thirds of US capabilities. The US's first line of defense against China is the place that's likely to be ground zero for World War III, Taiwan. The small island democracy broke away from the mainland after the nationalists were expelled by the communists in the aftermath of World War II. Since then, the former dictatorship has become a vibrant democracy that has refused to reunify and put themselves under control of the Chinese Communist Party. Securing Taiwan is not just important for the ever-intensifying global clash between authoritarianism and democracy, but also for very important political and economic reasons. Firstly, Taiwan produces around 50% of the world's semiconductors after U.S. companies ceased production at home due to expense. Semiconductors are important for every single gadget in your life. The global economy quite literally runs on them and they've become as valuable as a commodity as gas and oil. China itself produces between 25 and 30 percent of the world's semiconductor supply. So if China were to take Taiwan, it would now be in control of three quarters of the global semiconductor supply. This would allow China to effectively shut down the economy of any nation that disagrees with it by simply barring the sale of semiconductors to it, giving China incredible power to further control global affairs and reducing the West's ability to oppose its authoritarianism. Taiwan is also politically important, as it makes up part of what's known as the First Island Chain. This is a chain of islands that extends from Japan to the Philippines and acts as a very physical barrier to the expansion of Chinese influence in the Pacific. If China were to take Taiwan, it would not just break this carefully orchestrated containment strategy, but allow China to effectively neuter Japan's ability to resist it. With aircraft and ships stationed off Taiwan, China could target Japan's lines of communication and trade routes that cross the Pacific and hem the nation in, forcing it into subservience under threat of economic starvation. If China takes Taiwan, the U.S. commitments to defend the Philippines and Japan would be made much more difficult, if not impossible. To defend Taiwan, the U.S. has inked several deals, selling the nation advanced weapon systems ranging from fighter aircraft to air and missile defenses. U.S. military advisors have worked closely with the Taiwanese counterparts for years to prepare the nation for invasion. Despite threats from China, the flow of U.S. arms to Taiwan continues unabated, 
And recently, US President Joe Biden publicly voiced for the first time an unacknowledged truth in American politics. The United States will come to the defense of Taiwan in case of invasion. This greatly angered China, and the White House press corps was quick to walk the statement back. But what seemed like a political guffaw was likely yet another bit of intrigue meant to further the American strategy of keeping China guessing as to how the US might react to an invasion. If China cannot accurately predict what America will do should it invade Taiwan, it serves to create confusion and doubt amongst Chinese leadership. Should China prepare its economy for a flurry of global sanctions like Russia received after its invasion of Ukraine? Or should China expect American F-18s to swarm the skies over Taiwan and sink their invasion fleet? Strategic ambiguity is a powerful tool, and political theater is an excellent method for creating it. But the US is not planning on fighting a war against China alone. To this end, it has helped increase the capabilities of allies such as Japan and most notably Australia, who recently signed a military cooperation pact between itself, the United States, and the United Kingdom. The pact will not just provide security cooperation between the countries, but also help arm Australia with a fleet of nuclear attack submarines. This is of grave concern to the Chinese, who recently attempted to charm Australia away from its relationship with the US, a tactic which ultimately failed. In 10 years' time, China might not have to face off just against the US and British submarines, but Australian submarines also, putting the People's Liberation Navy as well as its all-important sea trade routes at increased risk. China imports most of its oil and gas over its seaborne trade routes, and this is exactly what the US is preparing to target in case of war in order to strangle the Chinese economy. Recently, security meetings between Japan, India, the US, and Australia were revived after a pause during President Trump's term. The Quad, as it's informally known, aims to tackle global problems such as global warming, cybersecurity, and ensuring a free and open trade environment in the Pacific. This is a veiled implication of the Quad's discussions on how to best handle China's expansion in the South Pacific. Currently, the Quad has no military commitment to each other, but that might change in the future as President Joe Biden makes the South Pacific and confronting China an area of pressing concern for the US. India is the only nation in the Quad without a formal security agreement with the US, and it has historically refused to sign on to any security partnerships with any nation. However, that may soon change as tensions between India and China escalate, and it becomes clear that India is not able to win a war against the superior Chinese military on its own. Bringing India into the network of security alliances in the South Pacific would effectively hem China in on all sides, and more importantly put allied ships and planes directly in the path of China's trade routes through the Indian Ocean. But the United States is also taking very material steps to confronting China. War with China would be waged at sea and in the skies, with very little of any action between the People's Liberation Army and the US Army. This will be a war of ships and planes, not of tanks and artillery, and the US is preparing accordingly. In an attempt to prepare for a confrontation with China in the skies, the US has accelerated the procurement of F-35s and made getting squadrons of the fifth-generation fighter into operational status a top priority. However, both the Navy and the Air Force have expressed reservations about the F-35's current readiness, which has prompted both the services to supplement orders of F-35s with orders of upgraded legacy aircraft, such as the F-15 Eagle for the US Air Force and the F-18 Super Hornet for the US Navy. To counter the threat of Chinese missiles, including its very vast arsenal of ballistic missiles capable of targeting US ships far out at sea, the Navy has also begun to expand the number of Aegis-equipped vessels in its fleet. Starting in 2015, the Navy also began to work on undoing the strategy of carrier-based sea dominance that it's employed since the end of the Cold War. With the fall of the Soviet Union, the US Navy enjoyed unmatched superiority and complete freedom of action anywhere in the world, and thus surface fleets were retasked with simply protecting carriers. Anti-submarine warfare and anti-surface warfare skills had atrophied as naval strategy centered completely around the big carriers. Now the US Navy is preparing its crews to once again face off against near-peer foes in ship-to-ship -ship battles. Submarines are America's second greatest naval asset after aircraft carriers, and yet remain nearly completely forgotten by most of the world, which is exactly how they like it. Currently, the US has a fleet of 68 submarines and is replacing the Cold War Los Angeles-class fast attack submarines with the new Virginia class. Investment in submarines has stalled recently and procurement plans are behind schedule, but the United States retains a significant advantage in undersea combat, despite China having a larger force of less advanced submarines. The realm of hypersonic missiles has received a great deal of attention ever since it was announced that the US was lagging behind both Russia and China in their development. 
Yet there's some misinformation and confusion regarding this technology that's made Russia and China seem as if they hold a significant advantage over the US in this realm when they really don't. Firstly, any ballistic missile is hypersonic. And China's recent test that saw a hypersonic missile fly around the world is not very impressive from a military point of view. Technically speaking, this simply doesn't add any additional capability that didn't already exist. The real threat from hypersonic missiles comes from maneuverable hypersonics. These are missiles that can not only fly at hypersonic speeds but can also maneuver while doing so, making them incredibly difficult to defend against. In this area, all three nations are still struggling to field fully operational missiles, but the US has made great strides in recent tests. One area where the US may in fact be coming up short is the development of advanced long-range air-to-air missiles. Recent photos of Chinese jets show that China has begun to field advanced beyond visual range missiles, while the US is still largely equipped with the AIM-120, an extremely capable and combat-proven air-to-air missile that nevertheless is only effective at medium ranges. However, the Pentagon's F-3R program aims to improve the capabilities of American air-to-air -air missiles by not just greatly expanding their range, but also improving efficiency in an electronically contested environment. A new generation of American missiles will feature two-way data links, GPS-enhanced inertial measurement units, an expanded no-escape envelope to increase lethality, and improved high-angle off-bore sight capability, allowing pilots to fire missiles without their plane being pointed directly at the enemy, thus lowering their vulnerability. However, the next step for US fighters is the AIM-260, which will feature beyond visual range capabilities and match longer range opposition missiles while bringing the tried and true technologies of the AIM-120. But World War III will also likely involve action against Russia in Europe, as China and Russia are both likely to cooperate in such a scenario. This will be a partnership of opportunity, however, not of choice, as relations between the nations are difficult at best, and Russia grows increasingly frustrated at its status as the junior partner. With Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the Russian military has proven itself incompetent, corrupt, and inept at executing a modern 21st century war. Despite vastly superior firepower, the Russian offensive in Ukraine has all but stalled out. And this is with Russian forces facing a foe that has a fraction of the capabilities of the US military. Simply put, the only real threat Russia can bring to a global war scenario is their nuclear power. With the bulk of the US Army not taking part in operations in the Pacific, Russia would be easily contained by current US ground firepower while NATO would be short on critical air assets. These are capability gaps easily filled in by NATO air forces. Four months ago, we would have spent an additional 10 minutes explaining to you how the US is preparing to counter Russia. Today, after seeing what the Russian military is capable of, we honestly don't have to. While victory would come at a cost, NATO would most likely win a resounding victory over the Russian armed forces. The only real threat Russia would pose would be in the first few weeks as the bulk of American firepower is being shipped across the Atlantic and prepared for battle. This leaves the Baltics and Poland vulnerable, but the deployment of NATO rapid response forces would likely be enough to slow down an initial Russian offensive and greatly limit its gains until NATO's European partners can fully mobilize their own armies. US strategy to counter Russian aggression in the next world war is thus based around preparing European partners to better defend their own continent and not be so reliant on the US military, as the conflict against China will consume the bulk of US sea and air power. The Pacific is where the real war will play out, and after its stunning losses in Ukraine, it's unlikely Russia would willingly engage NATO in a third world war anyway. Negotiations are over, the weapons are on high alert, and World War III is imminent. Where's the best place to be and which countries are destined to be destroyed in the biggest global conflict in 80 years? The answer is a little more complicated than it appears. To start, we need to figure out what World War III is likely to mean. The world has had plenty of conflicts in the last few decades, but they're usually either a powerful country imposing its will on a smaller one or invading it for a specific purpose, like we're seeing in Ukraine right now and Iraq in the early 2000s. There have also been thorny regional conflicts, like the constant border skirmishes between India and Pakistan, but none have exploded into World War III. And when it does happen, we'll probably know it. World War III is likely to involve two major blocs of nations around the world. On one side, we'll see the US and its NATO allies, most of Western Europe along with Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and South Korea, India and Israel, both of which have strong ties to the bloc, are likely to work with them as well. Then in the other corner we have the United States' two closest rivals for the superpower crown, Russia and China. While the two countries aren't in perfect harmony over Russia's invasion of Ukraine, they both view the US as their chief rival and are likely to work in sync if a war breaks out. China would likely pull its two nuclear-armed allies, Pakistan and North Korea, along with the ambitious Iranians who are looking to join the nuclear club. 
A small group, only joined by a select few other nations, but certainly a powerful bloc in terms of military strength. And this conflict will start in a familiar place. World War III isn't likely to break out from nowhere. It'll be the continuation of ongoing conflicts. The most likely flashpoint is in Eastern Europe. If Russia takes the continued supply of NATO weapons to Ukraine as a declaration of war or attacks a NATO nation directly, it would trigger Article 5 and bring all NATO members into the war. Likewise, if Russia wins the war in Ukraine and declares it Russian territory, then it might just view NATO's presence on its border as a provocation. And just like it did in 1939, the battle for Europe would begin. And when one conflict breaks out, others are sure to follow. Ukraine is to Russia what Taiwan is to China. The larger power has never given up the hope of reclaiming it even after decades. And in China's case, they've never ever acknowledged Taiwan as an independent nation. The chaos in Europe has created the perfect chance for China to move on Taiwan and try to conquer it without getting into a larger war, hoping that the United States, which has pledged to defend Taiwan, would be too busy to jump into the fray. Of course, if that gambit fails, we're likely to have a shooting war between the US and China across the Pacific Ocean, and this explosion of conflict could lead to more flare-ups. Would North Korea take advantage of China's move on Taiwan to launch its own assault on South Korea? Would the ongoing India-Pakistan border conflicts break into something larger? Would the mullahs of Iran finally attempt to destroy Israel and potentially trigger retaliation from the secret nuclear power? Who else will get involved? And who will be left standing when the smoke clears? First, let's look at who's likely to come away scot-free. The safest continent to be in the outbreak of World War III might just be South America. The continent is heavily dominated by mainstream left-wing parties and have friendly relations with both the US and Russia, so the odds are they'll stay neutral in the conflict. All these countries are democracies with the exception of the chaotic Venezuela. Also working in their favor is the fact that no South American country has nuclear weapons and most have militaries only designed for domestic use. Not only are they unlikely to get involved directly in any conflict, but there isn't likely to be any motivation for a country to invade them. While it's possible they could be used as a staging ground for attacks to the north, there are much easier ways to attack the United States. Thus, the only thing South America likely has to worry about in World War III is nuclear fallout drifting their way if everything gets completely out of control. They're not the only countries that can breathe easy. Probably the most remote country in the world, New Zealand is in a lucky position. While it's firmly aligned with the Western Bloc and its fate is closely tied to that of its much larger neighbor Australia, it's more likely to avoid trouble for one simple reason. Australia is a pretty good shield. Australia is a massive nation that's closely tied to NATO and hosts US and British military facilities. While it's unlikely Australia will be totally destroyed, as it is a large country with a small military force, it could definitely find itself occupied by a foreign army. But would these invaders proceed to New Zealand? The answer is probably not. New Zealand doesn't pose much of a threat militarily and is one of the most remote countries in the world. If they didn't get directly involved, New Zealand might be able to ride out the war. And as Australia is unlikely to be targeted by nuclear weapons, fallout will likely not be a threat. And the same goes for a continent that's breathing a sigh of relief. For hundreds of years, Africa has been treated as an all-you-can-eat buffet by colonial powers, with almost all the countries on the continent being invaded, colonized, and looted of their resources and even their people. Today, they have a complex relationship with the world's great powers, but many countries are seeing their economies grow at an astonishing rate and other countries investing in factories and talent there. China in particular has seen its investment in the continent grow, with many key factories producing high-tech components used in military warfare being hosted in these nations. Africa has no nuclear powers, and its militaries are unlikely to get involved directly in any conflict. So the most likely problem Africa is going to face is dealing with rival powers interfering in each other's investments. But for other countries, prospects are thornier. Could the United States survive World War III? Well, they have a few advantages. For one thing, they're relatively isolated away from main flashpoints, which also allowed them to experience minimal conflict on the home front during the first two world wars. But this time, there's an additional threat. Nuclear weapons, which means that the enemies can hit any country anywhere in the world. It's believed only Russia and China have the ability to hit the US homeland right now, with North Korea trying to join the party. The US is also very spread out, with dozens of cities dotted around the world's third largest country. While it could sustain some massive hits if the war goes nuclear, it's well equipped to survive. And if its survival is truly in danger, so is the rest of the world's. Its most vulnerable areas might be its Pacific holdings, including the state of Hawaii and the territory of Guam. And its neighbors are largely in the same boat. There's a reason there isn't likely to be any major conflict on North American soil. All of the countries there are relatively friendly with each other. Canada is a member of NATO and a close ally of the US, and the two are likely to be on the same side. 
Relations with Mexico can be a little chillier, and the country was famously approached to join Germany in World War I with the promise of reclaiming its lost territory, but it's not likely to actively side against the United States. These two countries aren't likely to be targeted directly during the war except in a full-scale nuclear barrage. Although Canada is uniquely vulnerable in some ways, that's because despite being the world's second largest country, the vast majority of its population is located in less than 10 cities, less than an hour from the US border. And in the same boat is one of the ringleaders of the other side. China is likely to be a key player in World War III along with Russia as the leaders of the forces opposing the US and its allies. But it's in a better position strategically. For one thing, the belligerent Vladimir Putin is likely to provoke retaliation from his enemies with big flashy war crimes, while the ruthless Xi Jinping will be able to stay further under the radar. China is also roughly the size of the United States and is the most populous country in the world. If things escalate to nuclear weapons, the country will likely take some massive hits, probably from the US, but also possibly from India. But it would be very hard for its enemies to destroy the country without endangering the future of all life on Earth. The same can't be said for these countries. These are the ones that are in the biggest danger of being wiped off the map. We have to start with the most vulnerable countries in the case of World War III breaking out, Ukraine and Taiwan. If this global war starts, it'll likely start right there, and some might say it already has. Right now, Ukraine is turning the tide on Russia. They're supplied with heavy-duty NATO artillery and are shooting down Russian planes and blowing up their ships, while Russia is limited to committing indiscriminate war crimes with an army increasingly staffed by draftees. But if Putin gets backed into a corner and starts using nuclear weapons, the tide could turn very quickly, and Ukraine could see its largest cities destroyed in a flash. From there, it would be overrun, and the devastated country would become little more than a staging ground for Putin's next conquest, and the same could happen half a world away. China is less likely than Russia to use nuclear weapons against Taiwan, mostly due to Taiwan's small size. Such an attack could destroy the small island, but because of China's ambition to reincorporate the nation, it is unlikely. In order to do that, it would likely start with a shock and awe attack, hitting Taiwan with a naval assault, blasting through its defenses, and likely causing mass destruction as well as loss of power and access to resources in its largest city, Taipei. This would all happen very fast, and while Taiwan could likely hold out for a while, China has more resources and deadlier weapons. Unless the United States got directly involved and started firing back, Taiwan would likely still exist as a plot of land, but the nation, its government, and the people would become nothing more than a pawn and a hostage for China. Back in Europe, Ukraine isn't the only country in danger. Putin's had his sights on access to the Baltic Sea for a long time, and its only water access is limited. The odds are these small nations would be the first on the chopping block once Putin triumphs over Ukraine and World War III is on. All these countries, Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia, are in NATO, but any pretenses of respecting that larger alliance are likely out the window at this point. Putin will be looking to reclaim its borders of the old Soviet Union, and these countries all border Russia or its puppet state Belarus. That makes them easy pickings. And the countries to Russia's south aren't any safer. Russia has long held that it wants NATO off its border, and NATO members close by would be likely its first targets. That includes Moldova and Romania. And in those cases, there's an extra thorny issue to discuss. A semi-autonomous region called Transnistra that is claimed by both Russia and Moldova. But Russia has long held that the region's residents would like to join Russia. Is this true? No one knows, and any referendum they hold would likely be conducted at gunpoint, just like the ones done in Donbass. But in the breakout of a larger conflict, the odds are that Russia would just march in, take Transnistra, and maybe even Moldova for that matter. If things went further, like the Baltic states, this would lead to war with NATO as the next country in the region on Russia's chopping block is Romania, who is a member of NATO. But Putin is largely past the point of caring. In fact, just about all of Europe would be facing an existential threat. While Russia is gigantic, the same can't be said about any of its neighbors. In the events of a full-on nuclear war, most of Putin's enemies could find themselves suffering massive destruction and loss of life. Most of these countries would have key cities that could be easily targeted with mid-range missiles from Russia, if those missiles still work. Russia relies heavily on Cold War-era weaponry, and that means anything could happen. But if he lets the missiles fly, Germany, France, and the UK could all face annihilation, and so could the rest of the world. If Putin maintains a more measured approach, he would likely continue advancing from his earlier conquests, and that means Poland and Finland would likely also be in serious danger. But Russia has invaded Finland before, and the Finns proved to be more than the Russians bargained for. So Europe's fate lies in the hands of Putin making the right choice. That's comforting. In Asia, it's a different story. China's military is newer and more effective than Russia's, so the odds are they'd take a different approach. 
They've been dealing the death of a thousand cuts to many nearby nations already, particularly Vietnam and the Philippines. They've been taking over the territorial waters, creating artificial islands to serve as military bases, and declaring the entire South China Sea as their territorial waters. None of these countries are prepared for a full-scale war against a major power, so odds are they'd be taken over quickly in the event of a war, with China using them as a staging ground for a larger conflict. That would possibly inflict massive damage on those nations, but would be unlikely to destroy them. The same can't be said for another neighbor. If there's a country in Asia that's most vulnerable besides Taiwan, it's probably Japan. The strongest economy in Asia besides China, it's a key US ally, but it also doesn't have a particularly strong military due to World War II treaties. It relies heavily on the United States for its defense and houses a large number of soldiers and military bases, which makes it an inviting target for a Chinese attack. This would be seen as a two-for-one benefit if war breaks out over Taiwan. Not only would China be potentially kneecapping the American fleet, but it would be getting long-awaited revenge on Japan for the devastation caused by Imperial Japan on China almost a century ago. Could Japan become both the first and second country to be hit by a nuclear weapon? It depends on how much China wants to escalate, but it's definitely the most likely initial target for China in the region. And if China and the US go to war, there are a lot of countries in the way. What do Kiribati, Tuvalu, and Nauru have in common? They're all some of the smallest countries in the world. And they're also in the way if a war breaks out between the United States and China. They're part of a network of small island nations in Oceania along with Vanuatu, Fiji, Samoa, Micronesia, and the Solomon Islands, and the Cook Islands. And if a full Pacific war breaks out, odds are they'll be quickly invaded by whichever country gets there first. They're closer to China, which makes occupation by them more likely. And while it's unlikely that they'd be hit by heavy artillery, these vulnerable nations could cease to exist very quickly and wind up as heavily damaged pawns in a larger conflict. And while these superpowers battle it out and smaller nations hang in the balance, some other countries might be in serious danger from local enemies. There's another country that plays a host to a huge number of US troops and bases, South Korea, which has heavily relied on the US for its defense since the Korean War armistice. But unlike its enemy North Korea, it doesn't have nuclear weapons. As a key ally to the US, it would be seen as an enemy to China, but they're unlikely to attack it directly. That would be seen as a massive escalation by the US and likely trigger an attack on the mainland if its military bases like the massive Camp Humphreys were hit. But bad news for South Korea is China doesn't have to attack them. China is one of the few countries that maintains good relations with the Hermit Kingdom of North Korea. And they try their best to keep the unpredictable Kim Jong-un under control. But what if they take the leash off and say, go to town? That would be an effective way to keep South Korea occupied while they go after US interests. But things could get out of control very quickly. Both Koreas are small nations, and North Korea could deliver a devastating blow to its enemy by using its short-range nuclear weapons to wipe Seoul off the map, clearing the way for an invasion into a destabilized country. But they might get more than they counted on. For one thing, using nuclear weapons on their close neighbor might lead to significant fallout hitting North Korea. But more dangerously, North Korea would immediately become a top target for the US and likely to be targeted with massive bombing raids if not nuclear retaliation. It's very likely that if a full-on conflict between the two Koreas broke out in the middle of World War III, neither country would be in functioning shape by the time it was over, which would make the entire region highly vulnerable to a quiet Chinese takeover from their northern border. And to the south, another conflict could spiral completely out of control. Unlike North and South Korea, neither India nor Pakistan have unstable governments or leaders, and both are fairly even in military strength and nuclear arsenal. That might keep both at bay, as the Kashmir border conflict stays on a low boil even as India backs America's alliance and Pakistan backs China's. But there's no guarantee of that. We've seen deadly border conflicts in recent years, and cooler heads usually prevail. But would the same hold when all countries all over the world are being brutally bombed? Or would one of the powers decide now is the time to settle the conflict permanently? The two countries are neighbors, and while they're both large countries, a large-scale nuclear conflict could likely bring fallout into both nations. They're also densely populated. Both are in the top 10 most populated nations, with India and the cusp of first place. So any conflict would come with massive loss of life. The case scenario if a conflict breaks out is that both countries would stick to conventional weapons, resulting in a conflict full of death and destruction, but without the earth-shaking weapons that could turn both countries into wastelands. But if one reckless leader crosses the line, 
It could result in a chain of events that would lead to more death than we've ever seen before, and in the aftermath the odds are good that China would sweep into the region just like it would in Korea. Would another potential flashpoint blow up in the Near East? It's questionable whether Israel will even directly get involved in World War III, but it may not have a choice. The small Mediterranean nation is between a rock and a hard place, and while it would likely be firmly aligned with the American side, it might choose not to send troops to any combat theater. That's because it tries to maintain good relations with Russia, both because of the Jewish population in the former Soviet Union and because Russia plays a key role in Syria, Israel's northern neighbor. If Russia thought Israel was betraying it, it could easily unleash its proxies in Syria to rain rockets down on the small country and cause major casualties that Israel's Iron Dome missile defense system couldn't prevent. But while Israel might not be looking for a fight, the fight might come to Israel. There's no country that Israel has worse relations with than Iran, especially after the former president Mahmoud Ahmadinejad threatened to wipe it off the map. As Iran ramps up its nuclear program, Israel is on high alert to potentially attack its infrastructure like it did to Iraq and Syria in the past. But would Iran strike first? The current president has denied the Holocaust happened and threatened Israel repeatedly so it might decide that a global conflict is a great opportunity to make its move. If it used conventional weapons, Israel would likely respond tenfold and a new bloody regional conflict would kick off. But there's one deadly X factor here. If Iran was able to finish its nuclear weapon or get help from North Korea or another rogue nation, it could attempt to hit Israel and wipe the tiny country out. Israel has a robust missile defense system, so there's a chance it could divert the hit and avoid a nuclear blast. But successful or not, an attempted nuclear attack would likely trigger massive retaliation and Israel would almost definitely respond to a successful nuclear hit with its own secret nuclear arsenal, and it likely has enough to turn Iran into a shell of its current self. So if things spiral out of control, it's possible both Israel and Iran could face existential threats. And there's one more country in the crosshairs. We've talked about the United States and China, and why they're likely to survive World War III even if it goes nuclear. Both countries are large enough and stable enough that they could likely take nuclear hits and survive, even if it resulted in massive amounts of damage. The only way either country could truly be destroyed is if things escalated to a point where the survival of humanity was threatened. But the same doesn't apply to Russia. While it is the largest country in the world, it's also uniquely vulnerable in some key ways. Here's how World War III could lead to the end of Russia as a nation. While Russia has over 145 million people, it also has one of the largest metro areas in the world, Moscow, which houses close to 10% of the country's total population. It's the home of much of the country's infrastructure, which means that the world could respond to a Russian nuclear attack by obliterating their largest city in the blink of an eye. Their second largest city, St. Petersburg, has over 5 million people and would likely be targeted as well, and no city besides those two has more than 1.6 million people. Those other cities are scattered around the massive Russian landscape, and it's likely that if the Russian government were decapitated in a strike, it would be very hard for the country to recover, and that could lead to a devastating chain reaction. Russia has repeatedly threatened the use of nuclear weapons, but no one knows how many functioning ones they have. Some could fire and hit their targets, others could misfire, and some might not even fire at all or blow up in their missile silos. But as soon as Russia uses nuclear weapons, NATO and its allies will retaliate, potentially leading to world-ending consequences. And in the aftermath, Russia might not look anything like itself. Russia got to this size via conquest, and that can be taken away. With so many different ethnic groups in the country, it's likely many would want to take advantage of the chaos to take control of their fate. We could see a much worse division of the country than we did after the collapse of the Soviet Union, with Russia losing some areas to other neighboring nations taking back their territory and others declaring independence for the first time in centuries. And as for Russia itself, its fate might be familiar to another European nation. Russia would be held responsible for starting World War III, probably more than any other nation. After all, the chain of events started in Ukraine, so once defeated, Russia would likely be subject to harsh sanctions just like Germany was after both world wars. It would be stripped of its conquests and additional territories, and many of the resources would likely be seized to pay reparations. European nations would lay claim to border regions, and top Russian officials would face war crimes charges. In the aftermath of losing World War III, Russia would likely be a sliver of its previous self, under occupation, and with many of its ethnic groups no longer considering themselves Russian. Would there still be a country called Russia? It's likely, but it wouldn't look or act anything like the Russia we know today. Of course, then there's that other possible answer to the question of which countries would be destroyed in World War III. In the worst case scenario, it might just be all of them. World War III has broken out. The most powerful countries on the planet are launching missiles at one another and sending invasion forces across the globe. 
it's only a matter of time until you get caught up in the whole thing. All you want at this point is a safe place to lie low and wait for the whole thing to blow over. Should you go to an island nation, in the tropics, or a country at the bottom of the world? Maybe there's an even safer place that you didn't even know existed. Let's find out which safe haven is right for you. It's impossible to tell who exactly will instigate World War III, but we have some pretty good ideas. The most likely scenario would start with one country invading another. This would cause the allies of the country being invaded to come to their aid. Slowly, more and more nations would get pulled into the conflict. At some point, this confrontation would reach critical mass, and an all-out world war would commence. The sides are pretty easy to predict for World War III as they probably would follow the current geopolitical climate. One side would consist of the United States, the European Union, and the rest of NATO, while the other side would be made up of Russia, China, North Korea, and their allies. There would probably be some wild cards that we can't predict, but one thing is for sure. World War III would be a true world war. What we mean by this is that very few people would be able to escape the carnage. Unlike the previous world wars, humans now have the ability to fight one another over long distances using aircraft, long-range missiles, and space warfare. Very few regions of the planet would be untouched by the events of World War III. However, this does not mean there aren't any safe places to run to. In fact, a few countries would provide safety and peace of mind as the world falls apart around you. If you're looking for a safe country to escape to during World War III, some of your best options are tropical islands. This may sound too good to be true, but hear us out. The good thing about islands in the Pacific Ocean is that they are really far away from each other and the mainland. The Pacific Ocean is a vast place, and if you don't mind warm climates, catching your own fish dinners, and white sand beaches, Fiji would not be a bad place to wait out World War III. This island nation sits in the southwestern part of the Pacific Ocean. The closest continent is Australia, which is still over 1,700 miles away. And the great thing about this is that during World War III, Australia probably won't be hotly contested over, which just adds to the allure of escaping to Fiji. Even if the fighting eventually reached the Australian continent, you would be so far away that you probably wouldn't even notice. Fiji itself doesn't have much to offer in terms of wartime strategy or resources. It has a very small military of around 6,000 individuals, so it would not be seen as a threat by either side. But perhaps one of the best things Fiji has going for it in terms of remaining safe during World War III is that it doesn't have many natural resources within its borders. Beautiful beaches and an abundance of seafood tend not to be what the world's superpowers are after while at war. This means Fiji would likely not be a target, making it one of the safest countries you can move to if World War III ever broke out. While the world descended into chaos, you could be sipping pina coladas on a white sand beach with a fishing pole in the water. Or better yet, you could be drinking the national beverage of Fiji called kava, which is made of the crushed root of the yangona, which has been shown to have medicinal properties. This is another thing that would make Fiji such a good nation to hide away in if World War III happened. Although it doesn't have strategic significance, it does have an endless supply of food, fertile lands to grow crops, and plenty of ways to keep yourself busy. In fact, there are around 300 islands that make up the country of Fiji. So if you didn't get along with your neighbors, you could just load up your boat and cruise to a different island. The only problem is that you'd be so far removed from the fighting that you might not know who was winning or even when the war came to an end until long after it was all over. During a world war, global communication would probably go down as satellites are targeted by each side to disrupt enemy transmissions. This would mean the only way to receive news would be by word of mouth. Like in the olden days, before the internet or telephones, you'd have to wait until someone physically came to the island and informed you about what was going on across the ocean. Then again, if you're trying to escape World War III, you probably don't mind not being up to date on wartime news, so this wouldn't be a deal breaker. If Fiji isn't isolated enough for you, there is another island nation in the Pacific that could be even more appealing to hide on during World War III. Tuvalu is a 10 square mile island chain just over 1,000 miles north of Fiji, making it even further from mainland. There are only around 11,000 people on the islands of Tuvalu, and its remote location and lack of natural resources make it an undesirable target for either side during World War III. If you did seek refuge in Tuvalu, it's likely you wouldn't see anyone new for the duration of your time in the island nation. Tuvalu is hard to get to in the best of times, so the two airlines that fly to the country probably won't be doing so at all with a world war going on. This means that the only other way to access the country is by boat. It's unlikely that one of the sides in World War III would divert resources to Tuvalu as it serves no strategic significance, but like Fiji, there is plenty of food and resources that can be gathered from the ocean to help sustain you throughout the war. There's another island country that is much larger than Fiji and Tuvalu, and although it's a little closer to the mainland, it would still provide safety during World War III. New Zealand is a beautiful nation that seems to have plenty of every type of environment crammed into a single island. If you're looking for a safe place to hide from the carnage of World War III and still want seasons and ecological diversity, New Zealand is the country for you. 
The country itself is a little over a thousand miles from Australia, but it sits further south in both Fiji and Tuvalu, meaning that New Zealand could potentially be further away from the main front of World War III, which we would expect to happen in Europe, Asia, and in the North American continent. However, there are many more natural resources in New Zealand than in most other island nations. This would be beneficial if you sought refuge there during World War III, but it could also make the nation a target for invasion. However, due to where it's located, this seems highly unlikely. There also isn't really much strategic significance to invading the country. The nation itself has fertile lands, abundant marine resources, and various landscapes that would provide protection even if the war did reach the island. Around 30% of New Zealand is protected land, which means there are plenty of areas where resources can be gathered, and where you could hide away if needed. It may sound crazy, but there is another abundant resource on the island that would help you ride out World War III. For every person in New Zealand, there are 10 sheep. This means you have plenty of wool to make clothes and a source of protein if times get hard. The sheep also help fertilize the land and can provide milk as well, meaning that these useful creatures will be your best friends as you safely wait for the war to come to an end. There are many benefits to living in New Zealand even when the world is not at war, but perhaps what would make this nation the ideal location to move to is that its infrastructure is highly developed and the country has been working on becoming self-sufficient for decades. It's because of the steps that the government has taken in recent years to ensure the country remains a safe, comfortable place to live that New Zealand consistently is rated one of the top 10 happiest countries in the world. So if you're looking for a country that is isolated, safe, and provides an abundance of resources as well as beautiful land to live on during World War III, New Zealand has got you covered. New Zealand does its best to maintain a peaceful country, which means it'll likely stay out of World War III altogether. In fact, New Zealand is only second to Iceland on the Global Peace Index, which brings us to our next safe country if a world war breaks out. Iceland is over a thousand miles from the United Kingdom and the rest of Europe. This means it's unlikely the country will be any direct danger during World War III. Like many other island nations thus far, Iceland has tons of marine resources that would allow it to remain self-sufficient if World War III ever broke out. What makes Iceland a great place to be during a global war is that the country gets 100% of its energy from renewable sources, all of which are within its borders. Iceland harnesses a massive amount of geothermal energy and converts it into electricity and heat. While war rages across the planet, Iceland would not have to worry about procuring oil, coal, or any other forms of energy from different parts of the world. Being totally self-sufficient means Iceland could stay out of the conflict and focus on keeping the people inside its borders safe. Some parts of Iceland can be pretty arid and harsh, but there is abundant fresh water and seafood. If you made your way into the mountains of Iceland, you would be isolated and protected from the rest of the world. There are fewer resources in this region, but it's incredibly doubtful you would ever encounter a military force while living there. However, the best place to be in Iceland during World War III would be along the coast, so you could take advantage of the plentiful fisheries and aquatic resources. As long as you don't mind eating seafood every day, you would have a full belly for the duration of the war. There is plenty of land to settle down on in Iceland if you need to find a place to wait out the war. In fact, the current population puts an average of 8 people per square mile in the country. This means there is plenty of space for refugees of World War III if they decide to relocate to Iceland. If you plan ahead, you could even find a nice piece of land in a small Icelandic fishing village that's self-sufficient and safe to live in until the war is over. You might even decide to stay after it's safe to return home. There is one downside to Iceland, however. The fact that it sits between Europe and North America might cause it to be a staging area to launch invasions across the Atlantic. This scenario is not very likely, as both sides would probably blow each other up with nukes before they would send an invasion force across the Atlantic Ocean, but you never know. Even though there is a chance that a fleet might sail by Iceland or even make a stop on their way while crossing the ocean, living in northern Iceland will all but guarantee your safety during World War III. There are other island nations that would actually be closer to the action but could still offer some safety during World War III. One such country actually started out as a military fortress during the Crusades. Malta sits just off the coast of Sicily in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. In World War III, this might be a good country to run to if your plan is to get out of Europe, but at some point Malta would be consumed by the war. Until then, it could serve as a way out of the region to provide refugees for escapees. The nation of Malta is only around 122 square miles and has limited resources. This means it wouldn't be an initial target for either side at the beginning of World War III. There are several large fortresses around the island that were built by the Hospitallers and the Knights Templar during the Crusades. These could serve as safe havens as plans were made to evacuate people to safer lands. Malta has successfully fended off invasions in the past, so it's possible that they could do it again. 
Maybe Malta could also be an embarkation point for people trying to make it to the Azores Islands. This remote archipelago is technically part of Portugal, which would not be a safe country to be in during World War III. But the Azores' abundance of natural resources and its remote location in the Atlantic would definitely make it a safer place to be than many other parts of the world. The Azores have plenty of farmable land and a plethora of marine resources. However, people from Portugal and the rest of Western Europe might have the same idea and head straight for the Azores Islands at the same time. This might lead to overcrowding on the archipelago, but at least it would be safe for the time being. One part of the world that's so often overlooked at the end of the world scenarios is South America. World War III will likely be fought in the Northern Hemisphere. The most probable scenario would be World War III starting in Europe or Asia. And although it's doubtful that World War III will reach North America until later on, the countries near the United States would be targets at some point. Canada is a vast country, and there'd be plenty of locations that would remain untouched by World War III due to its size and untamed wilderness. However, coastal cities and certain places along the U.S. border would be attacked as a means to invade the U.S. The same could be said about Mexico. Although there are likely regions in the highlands and jungles of the country that would remain safe, its overall proximity to the U.S. would make other parts of Mexico vulnerable to attack. However, South America is far enough away from the U.S. and any other major players in World War III that it would be an ideal place to go once the fighting broke out. The safest country in this scenario would be Chile. Chile is the southernmost country in South America. Not only that, but the city of Puerto Williams is the southernmost city in the entire world. The country itself has tons of natural resources and numerous geological features that make it an easy escape if the war ever does reach South America. Chile is one of the most developed nations in all of South America, meaning there's already infrastructure in place to sustain the country if the rest of the world is at war with each other. There are two options of where to go in Chile that would ensure your safety during World War III. The Andes Mountains stretch across the entire western part of the country, and it's in these mountains that the indigenous communities have lived for hundreds of years. There are endless amounts of fresh water and fertile land that can be terraced to grow crops. The mountains offer protection and serve as a deterrent for any enemy force that might try to occupy the country. The mountains and many other regions of Chile contain dense forests that can be used to build a cabin in the woods, and a number of wild animals that can provide sustenance in extreme circumstances. Not to mention that Chile is the fourth largest exporter of wine globally, which means while the northern hemisphere becomes a scarred battlefield of destruction and death, you could be getting tipsy off of some of the best wine in the entire world. The other option is settling as far south as possible. This next closest land from the southern tip of Chile is Antarctica. It's highly unlikely that any part of World War III would be fought in the frozen Antarctic waters. This means living in southern Chile would be pretty safe. The weather can be brutally cold, and storms often whip across the region, but the oceans are bountiful, and different varieties of potatoes grow pretty much everywhere in the country. And while we're talking about the extreme south, there's probably no safer place on the planet than Antarctica during World War III. You could theoretically take refuge in one of the science outposts there and wait for the fighting to end. No one's going to be coming to that Antarctica to wage the war. But the lack of resources and the inability to resupply during that time would make it important to ration resources. Eventually, you would run out of supplies and you would need to leave the continent. But if you could stay in Antarctica until peace was declared, you would be safe the entire time. There is one other southern country that is resource-rich and would be an excellent place to escape to during World War III. You could even go on a safari while you're there. South Africa contains around 10% of all plant, bird, and fish species in the world. It also is home to around 6% of mammal species. This makes South Africa an ideal place to hide from the turmoil of World War III. There are plenty of food sources, fresh water supplies, and fertile coasts in the country. It also helps that South Africa is very far away from the regions of the world that would be fighting. It's conceivable that the fighting wouldn't even reach its northernmost border, let alone the rest of the country. South Africa also consists of many types of environments, but there's probably no safer city in this part of the world to be in during World War III than Cape Town. This is a thriving city with modern infrastructure and resources all around it. There's plenty of fishing off the coast and the mountains that surround the city isolated from the rest of the continent. Cape Town isn't as far south as other cities, but its location would make it strategically undesirable. Therefore, South Africa would probably be left alone during the conflict. Also, like Chile, South Africa is a large exporter of wine. Between the abundance of food, its protected location, and the availability of alcohol, South Africa would be a safe and not too unpleasant country to spend World War III in. Greenland is massive. It is also freezing. But if there's any country in the world that you could find a safe place to wait for the end of World War III in, this would be it. The tricky part would be getting to your final destination once you were within the country's borders. There are no roads between the towns of Greenland. This is a good thing in terms of finding a safe haven. The more difficult the region is to reach, the safer it'll be during wartime. For optimal security, you'd want to choose one of the more northern towns to live in, like Kanak, which sits just inside the Arctic Circle. Like with Antarctica, the war will likely never reach you at this extreme latitude. 
You'd have to learn the ways of the Inuit people and learn how to live off the land in a polar climate, but it would all be worth it to have a safe and secure place to live during World War III. Due to Greenland's location and size, there's little reason for either side in World War III to try to invade its lands. If the war did happen to reach the part of the country you're in, you could always hop on a boat or helicopter and head further north. At some point, you'll find a town that's far enough out of the way that no military forces would find it useful. To be fair, Greenland as a whole holds very little strategic significance, and the only World War III action it would see would be ships sailing by to invade the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, or planes flying overhead. There would likely be no forces or troops stationed in the country itself. Living in rural Greenland would be much more difficult than sipping wine in Chile or fishing off a tropical beach in Fiji. However, Greenland would provide significant protection from the carnage of World War III while also providing the resources you need to stay alive. Depending on where you initially lived before World War III broke out, Greenland might be a more viable option for safety than some of the other countries in this video. For example, if you reside in the northeastern part of the US, Greenland would definitely be the closest safe haven to you. Just because it's cold and desolate doesn't mean you should count Greenland out in a time of war. Beggars can't be choosers. Although the countries on this list are all good options to escape to in the event that World War III breaks out, there is something that you need to remember. If you find yourself in any of the countries on this list when World War III starts, you will likely be safe as the war will pose very little threat to you. However, none of that matters if each side begins launching nukes at one another. The nuclear fallout from the blasts would be carried across the world on the planet's natural air currents. The rain falling from the sky would be poisonous as it would carry lethal doses of radiation in every drop. The nuclear explosions would incinerate anything in their vicinity, causing firestorms that would release massive amounts of smoke and ash into the atmosphere. This could plunge the planet into a nuclear winter where temperatures would plummet as the sun's light is blocked out by all the particulates in the atmosphere. At this point, it wouldn't matter if you were in Russia, the United States, or Antarctica, as there would be no escaping this global catastrophe. If this ends up being the ending of World War III, the safest place will be to not be on Earth, but in space. As the countries of the world annihilate one another and the planet using nuclear weapons, the astronauts aboard the International Space Station will look on in horror as their home is destroyed before their very eyes. For a short amount of time, they might be the last of the human species. Unfortunately, even the astronauts would run out of resources and die, and this would be the end of humanity, and it would be all because we couldn't get along with one another. So the safest thing you can do if World War III ever breaks out is to head to one of those countries from this video and hope the war comes to an end before the nukes start flying. If nuclear holocaust is the fate of the planet, then your only chance for survival is to hijack a rocket ship and head for the stars. Eventually, you'll die from lack of oxygen and resources, but at least you'll make it slightly longer than the rest of us. The alternative is to make your way to one of the countries with an abundance of wine and have a drink as the world falls apart around you. The unthinkable has happened and military forces clash on land, in the air, and on the sea, and underneath it, in the most violent war to date. But what would actually happen after World War III? The probability of a third world war is negligible but not impossible. All three of these big military powers who have the capability to launch a global war all have too much to lose by doing so. But history is full of examples of small conflicts spiraling completely out of control and beyond the plans of those who initiated them. To find out what the world would look like after World War III, we have to examine two different global wars, a conventional war and a nuclear war. One thing is for sure, the economic damage alone would reshape the face of the Earth. Such a war would inevitably begin by a confrontation between US and Chinese forces in the South or East China Sea. A Sino-US war isn't likely to go global and would require multiple escalatory steps to get there. First, China would have to directly threaten or attack Japanese forces, something that is predisposed to do already because of the presence of multiple US air bases in Japan. If China wanted to keep Japan out of the conflict, it would have to avoid striking these bases, which would have seriously detrimental effects on its ability to fight against the US. Next, a third party would have to be willing to exploit the situation to its own advantage. The most likely culprits here are India, Iran, and Russia. India would be tempted to act to push Chinese ground forces out of the contested northern border regions and perhaps even maneuver for itself to throw China out of Tibet, thus threatening Chinese freshwater supplies and granting it massive leverage over its rival. That's unlikely but not impossible, as a Sino-American war would largely be fought at the sea and in the air, leaving the People's Liberation Army free to fight against Indian incursion. Iran, however, is likely to exploit the diversion of US forces from the region for its own gain. A war between the US and China would inevitably cause a drawdown of US peacekeeping forces in other regions of the world. Currently, 60% of US firepower is in the Pacific. 
But as losses rapidly mount, the U.S. will need to pull reinforcements from its multiple other global commands. With American forces no longer acting as police against bad actors, Iran could use the opportunity to attack Saudi Arabia and other Gulf states with its superior military. This would hugely disrupt global oil trade and have devastating financial repercussions across the world. Russia might seek to exploit U.S. preoccupation with China for its own gain in Europe. While Russia has no ambition to rule all of Europe, it could see a drawdown of U.S. forces in Europe as the opportunity to take by force breakaway Soviet republics and even some of its NATO neighbors such as Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. In a worst-case scenario, all three flashpoints are ignited due to American preoccupation with China, leaving the world dramatically different after the war. Such a war is almost certain to end with a U.S. victory over China, although an extremely costly and poorly defined victory. Immediately at war's end, the United States military would be severely depleted, going from the world's most powerful fighting force to a significantly weakened force that still has global reach but will take a decade or more to restore itself to its former glory. American naval and air losses would be staggering, as with much of half of its air and naval fleets destroyed. Half of the U.S. aircraft carrier fleet would be sunk in a conflict with China, a loss of over $50 billion in ship costs alone, over 500 aircraft and over 12,000 seamen and aviators. The loss of all important American carriers alone would see the United States lose its ability to rapidly respond to global conflicts. This loss in capability would only be compounded by significant losses in the U.S. Air Force. Without the ability to rapidly and overwhelmingly respond to global crises, the immediate post-war years would see an ignition of regional wars across Africa in the Middle East. Critics of U.S. military presence around the world would rapidly see the cost of losing that peacekeeping force as simmering tensions suddenly explode in the absence of a threat of U.S. involvement. In the Middle East, Iran would seize the opportunity to attack its longtime rival Saudi Arabia. Despite being an oil-rich and wealthy nation, Saudi Arabia is handily outclassed militarily by Iran, as it has relied on the United States to keep Iran in check for decades. No other power is likely to prevent Iranian aggression in the Middle East, nor do they have the capability to do so. All Europe European powers, save for France, simply no longer have the expeditionary capabilities to respond to military conflicts around the world without U.S. support, and France lacks the assets needed to significantly counter Iranian aggression so far from its own shores. An oil-rich Iran would become a regional superpower, shaping the Middle Eastern policy to its own liking. This would inevitably lead to an explosion of extremism with waves of attacks against Europe and African nations, launching both continents into a dark age of terrorism. Enriched by Saudi Arabian wealth and oil fields, Iran could continue a campaign of conquest unchecked across the Middle East, forcing other neighboring nations into its fold and simply invading those that resisted. With its finger firmly on the oil tap to Europe, Iran would have great influence over European powers, likely leading to a necessary buildup of military forces in Europe and an inevitable invasion of the Middle East years later. A European Middle East war would be a world war in its own right, with staggering casualties on all sides and economically ruinous for both regions. Middle East turmoil would only make the lives of those in China worse. In the aftermath of a war against the U.S., the Chinese Navy and Air Force would be obliterated, with only those forces left in reserve in western China against India or Russian incursions left intact. Chinese infrastructure, at least along its eastern Pacific border, would also suffer moderate damage due to American long-range air attacks, while China can do little to militarily threaten the U.S. homeland. Large-scale damage to Chinese port facilities would only exuberate the damage caused by years of American naval blockade. China relies on the Pacific for the majority of its trade, and most importantly for the import of energy resources. Despite heavy losses, the U.S. Navy could still undertake an effective blockade of Chinese trade, crippling the nation and resulting in a GDP loss of as much as 35%. China, in return, could threaten U.S. trade in the Pacific as well, but would be unable to directly threaten either the American West or East Coast, resulting in only an expected GDP loss of 10% for the U.S. But the disruption of trade in what's the world's most important trade superhighway would only result in the weakening of the East Asian economies and, to a smaller extent, the entire world. East Asian nations would be the hardest hit due to their dependence on Chinese goods. This will have a knock-on effect on European nations who import cheap goods manufactured in East Asia. The ensuing worldwide economic recession will lead to flare-ups in social unrest and widespread unemployment. This, combined with a worst-case scenario of Iranian aggression in the Middle East, could set the stage for revolutionary movements 
violence in some countries and the flare-up of partisan tension spilling over into outright violence. Perhaps no nation would be as rocked though as China, who despite inflicting incredible losses on the US military would still be facing a humiliating defeat with a near total loss of its navy and air force. American cyber warfare operations would work to steadily degrade the Chinese government's ability to censor information electronically throughout the nation, and increasing unrest and war weariness would embolden pro-democracy and separatist factions in China. While it's likely that the Chinese government would remain intact, this would represent a significant threat to the Chinese Communist Party, directly leading to even more violent crackdowns on an increasingly rebellious population. We've already seen this scenario in miniature thanks to the Hong Kong riots, and while China showed restraint in Hong Kong because of international pressure, it's unlikely to show restraint when faced with similar uprisings within the mainland when the survival of the CCP is threatened. The further disruption of the Chinese economy would have a domino effect on the rest of the world, especially those nations that rely on China for critical technology and imports. Global GDP would shrink significantly, leading to unemployment and unrest across the world. While the rest of the world is suffering though, one nation might come out of a third world war smelling like roses. Russia has long suffered under a weakening economy, made worse by European sanctions due to its aggression in Crimea. However, the loss of Chinese trade routes throughout the war and a need by China to replace its destroyed military military equipment would be a massive financial boon to the state. European powers might be even willing to lift sanctions against Russia and provide economic concessions or even political ones such as allowing Russia to reabsorb former Soviet republics in exchange for the aid of the Russian military in fighting against Iranian aggression in the Middle East. A new global order after World War III would see Russia rising to a position of prominence it hasn't held since the days of the Soviet Union. But now let's look at a worst case scenario, complete and total nuclear warfare that spans the face of the earth. While a conventional World War III would still see the United States suffer the least militarily or economic harm, a nuclear war would almost completely level the playing field between China and the US, leaving both nations a ruined smoking wreck. The US still holds the advantage in number and sophistication of nuclear weapons, thus China would inevitably suffer far greater damage than the US. However, nearly every major US city would suffer at least one nuclear strike, with most coming under fire from multiple warheads. Should Russia join the fray, it would inevitably pull in nuclear NATO members such as as France and Great Britain, and spread thermonuclear warfare across four of the world's seven continents. Previous fears of nuclear winter have since been proven to be overblown, but a global cooling effect will still take place, dropping global temperatures by a few degrees. A drop of just one degree centigrade in global temperatures would make Canadian wheat growing impossible, showing us just how vulnerable the global food supply really is. What farmland isn't rendered fallow by a drop in global temperatures would likely be unusable due to nuclear impacts. Both the US and Russia target each other's vast swaths of farm land as nuclear targets, with the express intent of starving each other into submission in case of nuclear war. With the US alone exporting much of the world's grain, it wouldn't just be the Americans that starved, but much of the world as well. Compound that with strikes against Russia and Chinese food producing regions, plus contamination from other nuclear strikes, and hundreds of millions would begin to starve within weeks. The initial casualties would also be in the hundreds of millions, with hundreds of millions more falling prey to injuries and radiation sickness within days to weeks. Then secondary effects of global nuclear war would lead to even more deaths, as trade routes are disrupted, infrastructure is rendered inoperable, and diseases caused by high concentration of airborne debris strike down people by the millions. Many nations around the world would rely on imports to feed their populations, and the loss of global trade alone would doom tens of millions to immediate starvation. As massive plumes of choking dust and debris spread across countrysides in Australia, North America, Europe, and Asia, respiratory disease would claim millions more. Global firestorms would decimate wildlands, as fire Fires ignited by burning cities spread for hundreds of miles around, causing fires so fast that they'd be visible from space if not for all the debris in the atmosphere. If one could peer through that thick haze of gray that would remain aloft for days or even weeks, they would see a planet in flames, with fires raging for weeks or even months and killing millions more. The world population would likely fall to below 1 billion within 5 years of global thermonuclear war. Within a decade of starvation, disease, and conflict for dwindling resources, humanity would be lucky to number in the 500 millions. However, there is good reason to think that humanity would not go extinct after all and could even bounce back in time. Most nuclear strikes are designed to maximize destruction. A ground burst of nuclear weapon severity limits its destructive range, as most of the energy in the explosion is sent down into the ground or absorbed by ground features such as buildings, hills, etc. Therefore, nuclear weapons are designed to explode over their target, greatly enhancing their lethality and avoiding ground clutter altogether. While this makes nuclear weapons more lethal, it has the positive side effect of sending more of the resulting radiation upwards and into space. Fears of a global irradiated wasteland might be overblown, and while it's certain that radioactive
radioactive debris would be in harmful levels just about anywhere on Earth, humanity and the livestock and food crops it depends on could still survive in sufficient numbers to eventually bounce back. That's because the fissile material in a bomb is destroyed in milliseconds, causing an intense burst of radioactivity that quickly falls off as atoms decay in a chain reaction. In several years, most radioactive fallout would turn into more stable elements, such as strontium-90. With its half-life of 29 years, strontium-90 and similar materials are still harmful but not nearly as radioactive as materials with a half-life of hours, minutes, or even seconds. As Nagasaki and Hiroshima have proven, it doesn't take long for humanity to reclaim the ruins of cities struck by nuclear weapons. The real danger is in the sheer number of weapons employed in a global nuclear war, and thus the higher concentration of less dangerous but still harmful, longer-lived radioactive isotopes in the water and soil. Human lifespans will be shortened dramatically, and many species will go extinct due to climate change, natural ecosystems will collapse, and a staggering amount of pollution will be created by the incineration of hundreds of major cities. Even after all of that, within centuries humanity should be well on the rebound. What shape the world would take, however, is completely unknown, though it's likely that none of the current major powers would continue to exist as cohesive states. In all likelihood, it would be Africa which would become the lotus of economic and military power, as it's least likely to be directly affected by nuclear war, and unlike the rest of the world, they'd still be able to feed most of their population, as many African states have agrarian-based economies. One thing is certain, the nations that launched World War III would not be much more than dust, and utterly inconsequential in the new era of human history to come. A few years ago, if we talked about where you should or shouldn't be in the event of World War III, you might not have taken it very seriously. But in 2023, global war doesn't seem all that inconceivable. So who knows, in a few months, you could be thinking about buying a plane ticket out of your soon-to-be-smashed country. Listen carefully. This is where you don't want to be when it all kicks off. Number 15. We first need to set the scene for World War III to show you how realistic the possibility of it happening is. So, in the number 15 spot, we'll put the world in general. After all, World War III will affect just about every person in the world due to various disruptions. The week we started researching information for this video, the news media told us that the USA and its allies plan to provide F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine, whose position in the wrecked city of Bakhmut was also the focus of the global media that same week. Ukraine President Volodymyr Zelensky denied that Bakhmut was lost. Still, there was no doubt Russia was very close to completely occupying the city. Zelensky compared Bakhmut to the Japanese city of Hiroshima, which as you know, along with Nagasaki, was hit with an American-made atom bomb at the end of World War II. When Zelensky said those words, he was attending the G7 summit actually in Hiroshima, where he cozied up to the G7 nations, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, the UK, and the US. Countries you'll hear more about later. The group discussed China's militarization activities in the Asia-Pacific region, to which China said it had been smeared by nations interfering in China's internal affairs. It was a busy week. As China dusted itself off from the verbal bashing, the Russian Foreign Minister Alexander Grushko talked about how that F-16 plan was all part of the West's escalation scenario. He said this route means colossal risks, and Russia would still achieve its aims in Ukraine anyway. Meanwhile, political scientists have talked about the global balance of power, and some say that the so-called unipolarity in the world, with the US as the sole superpower, the hegemon, is under threat as China and Russia seek to usher in a multipolar world, the way it was for centuries. Some theorists have said if the powers cannot reduce these tensions by embracing a new politics of detente, we'll walk into World War III and it will be world-crushing. Many pundits have seriously talked about an escalation in Ukraine. They say Russia and Ukraine cannot win outright, and if Russia feels threatened to close its borders, its tactical nuclear weapons might be pulled out. If this happens, the escalation train will scream choo-choo through clouds of thick, rancid nuclear fallout. As the Open Democracy Network said in April, most Kremlin watchers take the view that losing Crimea would be a defeat too far for Putin, and the risk of it could push Russia into a direct threat to go nuclear. National security experts, former diplomats, and military bigwigs in the US belonging to the Eisenhower Media Network co-signed an open letter in May, stating future devastation could be exponentially greater as nuclear powers creep ever closer toward open war. They called Ukraine a new era of confrontation and slaughter that may well be our undoing. This is serious. If Russia uses tactical nuclear weapons, NATO will almost certainly respond, and if that happens, a global nuclear war is possible. Ok, so that's the setting for this show. Sure, it's one of our fictional disaster scenarios, but this is not a show about zombies or mega tsunamis. It's much more real than that. We aren't kidding around today. In this reality, we expect there to be two sides. 
The obvious one is the US and NATO, with China and Russia making up the lodestone of the enemy forces. Japan, India, Taiwan, Israel, Australia, and South Korea are on the side of NATO. Iran, Syria, possibly Pakistan, Belarus, and North Korea are on the side of Russia and China. It's hard to predict where all countries would get involved and where their alliances would stand if their regions became theaters of war. A lot of nations would want to stay neutral. Countries in South and Southeast Asia, South America, and Africa might indeed want no part of this Western war. It's hard to predict what will happen since a global war, as we'll show you today, will affect every nation. This is why we put everywhere at the number 15 spot. Whether it's nuclear fallout, inability to import essential goods, or not getting much needed aid, you won't have to be invaded or directly hit with bombs to feel the presence of war on your doorstep. Nonetheless, some countries are going to get smacked in the face with either a hard right or a left uppercut or worse, they're going to get their head completely knocked off. Number 14. Some countries wouldn't really have much of a chance in terms of fighting back in the event of World War III. They don't have large militaries or weapons of immense destruction to stage much of a fight. Such nations include Pacific Island nations, divided into Melanesia, Micronesia, and Polynesia. These islands have been and still are of great strategic importance in terms of security and defense. The Pacific Islands have been the focus of China for about a decade now, with many of these little nations receiving aid and means of development from China. In 2022, the Solomon Islands signed a controversial security pact with China. The US also has tried to cement relations with some of these nations, as has Australia. The war might not reach Australia and New Zealand, but it will reach the Pacific Islands. Everyone will want a military foothold in the Pacific. We don't know how it'll play out, but it might mean countries being swallowed up by their occupiers. They certainly won't be safe in World War III as they weren't in World War II. Number 13. As we said, a lot of countries will be indirectly affected by the war and many of them will be in Africa. On this continent, China has spent billions of dollars on infrastructure projects. Sudan, Algeria, Nigeria, and Egypt all have close military ties with China. It's hard to say if war will break out between pro-China and pro-US nations in Africa, but if it did, the pro-China side would likely be bigger. Africa is a big place with 54 countries. It's hard to understand where alliances lie, but numerous polls as of late have shown a preference for China over the West. The continent is starting to rely on China more than it does on the West. In 2023, it was reported that South Africa held a joint military exercise with China and Russia. China wants to establish more naval power in the Indian Ocean. It's pushing its navy out there already, with ships located in various areas to combat piracy. But it might be about more than that. China wants a military presence in the region to protect its position in natural resource-rich Africa. Many African nations have given their support to China's claim on Taiwan. In 2022, the Chinese foreign minister said, China-Africa relations are the bedrock of China's foreign policy. China has a lot of friends in Africa, many of whom have voiced concern and criticism about the US's role in the Ukraine war. One thing you have to understand is that some African countries already have profound humanitarian crises. We can't mention them all because that would take up the entire show, but we'll still say that this is a major factor for why the African continent will be hit hard by a potential World War III. In 2022, it was reported that in the Central African Republic, around 3.1 million people were in need of humanitarian aid, while in Angola, 3.8 million people didn't have enough food to eat. In Niger, 4.4 million live with food insecurity, and in Burundi, 50% of kids under 5 are said to be malnourished. The indirect effect of a world war would be devastating for these already impoverished countries, many of whom might have had to take a side. The war so far in Ukraine has made matters so much worse. Hundreds of millions of people in Africa have been displaced, with many of the poorest seeking refuge in neighboring African countries, their lives hanging by a thread. So can you imagine how they fare if the world erupted into full-scale war? Still, there's no chance they'll be getting nuclear bombs dropped on them, and they're a long way from nuclear fallout. Number 12. Like some African nations, already unstable nations will also suffer indirectly through worsening humanitarian crises. One of these countries is Afghanistan, which, according to humanitarian organizations in 2023, was at very real risk of systemic collapse and human catastrophe. Afghanistan's population is about 40 million people, and it's reported that 28.3 million of them currently need humanitarian assistance. The country is suffering, even though it's already receiving hundreds of millions in humanitarian assistance. A spokesperson for the UN in the country said in 2023 that the fate of the entire generation of Afghans is at stake. 
If there's a World War III, the country will be on the brink of collapse, and the war will very likely push it over the edge. We're not sure if the billions it receives in aid from all over the world, including China and the US, will be there any longer. This might not seem important to you, but it could mean millions of deaths. It is important. The same goes for Yemen, where American weapons, intelligence, and training have helped Saudi Arabia to destroy infrastructure and civilian life. The UK and France can also take a bow for creating this river of blood in Yemen. We won't go into all the details, but millions of innocent people have been displaced. At the same time, in 2023, it was reported that 23.4 million people would need humanitarian aid, while 17.4 million are looking at acute food insecurity. There has been lots of humanitarian assistance, but again World War III would put an end to that. As a result, many would die. Syria is also struggling, with reports now saying that things have become much worse in this country after Russia invaded Ukraine. It said 65% of the people in Syria now face food insecurity. 3 million people have been displaced in a country that has only just over 18 million people. The EU has managed to put together a 27.4 billion euro package to support the Syrians who most need it. But if the Ukraine war so far can do this much damage, what will happen when World War III comes around? And then you have Venezuela, which is also facing a humanitarian crisis and is in dire need of aid. South America might be one of the best places to be in World War III, but in Venezuela it's said 90% of people now live in poverty, while close to 7 million have been forced to leave. A world war would make things so much worse. In many nations where life is already tough, more and more people would arm themselves. Chaos would reign as more arms made their way into criminals' hands. Society could collapse. It would take too long to go through all the vulnerable nations of the world and how not receiving aid would cripple them. These are just a few examples, but trust us, many, many nations not even remotely taking part in World War III would see large parts of their population suffer and possibly starve. This would not just be a war about weapons. The explosions where the battles take place would ripple out like a giant lake of fire, engulfing the poorest parts of the planet. But now let's get down to business and talk about where the direct action would take place. Number 10. Israel, Iran, Saudi Arabia this one is tricky, so let's just say the region, already a bit unstable, could become much more unstable if World War III arrived. Israel is a very strong ally of the US, but also has very close ties to Russia, which is why it's maintained a hands-off approach in the Ukraine war. Iran and Israel get along about as well as Tom and Jerry, which could be problematic in a world war. Iran is certainly the US's enemy, Saudi Arabia has close ties with the US, you also have Iraq. Despite a war crimey US-UK led invasion that killed hundreds of thousands of people, Iraq and the US are now strategic partners. Iran and Iraq also have fairly good relations right now. That doesn't mean things won't kick off in this embattled region. Israel already has nuclear weapons, although we don't know how many. Iran doesn't have them yet, but its program could be sped up when its good friend Russia is under attack in a global war. You also have to remember that Israel and Saudi Arabia rely on food imports about as much as any other nation. In 2020, Israeli media reported Israel is dangerously unprepared for global food shortages. Saudi Arabia would also struggle as global supply chains face disruption in World War III. Such chaos can lead to conflict. As for actual military involvement though, it's very hard to say what would happen in the Middle East since US, Russia, and China relations are complicated there. Israel, we think, would feel quite insecure since Iran might take advantage of the situation as the US fights battles elsewhere. Still, many countries in the Middle East consider Ukraine a far-off war. As that war has raged on, the US has tried to isolate Russia in the Middle East and elsewhere, but has mostly failed. Russia has been busy making energy deals, building nuclear plants, conducting arms sales, and putting together summits in the Middle East. Countries such as Egypt and the UAE need Russia for trade. China and Saudi Arabia just completed a big oil deal, and journalists are now asking if China can replace the US in the Middle East. That is doubtful considering the US's security arrangements in the regions, but Russia still has potential allies in the region. The Middle East might want to stay out of World War III, but whether that's possible is another matter. This one's hard to call, but today we're not trying to speculate exactly what would happen in World War III, we just want to know where we would rather not be. We'd also prefer not to be in these next two countries if World War III kicked off. Number 9. India and Pakistan it's a hard call to say if they'd get involved in World War III, but you can't ignore the fact these two nations are nuclear powers. They're under no obligation to fight, but having those weapons might mean something in World War III. These days, like many countries around the world, 
India doesn't want to look too friendly with the US in terms of opposition to China. It's certainly not taking an anti-China stance, and it hasn't joined the sanctions in Russia. Around 50% of India's arms imports from 2016 to 2020 came from Russia. India is a part of BRICS, what's sometimes called a rival to G7 countries. They are Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. While China's leader Xi Jinping visited Putin not long ago, he started talking about a new global order, a multipolar order, where the US is no longer the hegemon. India was mentioned as being part of the new order. In terms of Ukraine, Pakistan has, like India, remained neutral. So again, this is a difficult call. Neither India nor Pakistan has a dog in the Ukraine war. Then why aren't we saying we wouldn't want to be here when the big fight kicks off? Well, just because there are two nuclear powers, and in war, countries might not have the choice to remain neutral. India and Pakistan also have been at each other's throats for decades, ever since the British partition of India. It's unclear just how many warheads Pakistan has, but it's thought the number is close to 200. Some sources say less, some say slightly more. It's estimated the weapons range from 5 to 12 kilotons, although some of the country's longer-range ballistic missiles might be in the 40 kiloton range. Its F-16 combat aircraft and Mirage 3 and 5 aircraft can launch conventional and nuclear strikes. At the same time, it has nuclear-capable short- to medium-range ballistic missiles and has seen some recent developments in cruise missile capabilities. As of 2022, India operates eight different nuclear-capable systems, two of them are aircraft, four of them are land-based ballistic missiles, and two are sea-based ballistic missiles. Both countries are capable of causing extreme damage to each other. Again, it's hard to believe that they would go to war, but anything could happen in World War III. Who knows how trade will be upset, how economies will suffer, and how a disagreement could spin out of control. India and Pakistan might have to pick a side. And what if they end up on opposite sides? These two nations will not be a good place to be when the world decides to implode. But you can be sure these next two countries will be a worse place to live. Number 8. If World War III broke out, two places we would rather not be are North and South Korea. China is the Hermit Kingdom's biggest trading partner. If there were a global war, North Korea would be on the side of China and Russia. It would actively join in, perhaps using its weapons to attack the South and even the USA. In 2022, North Korea announced that it recognized the independence of the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics in eastern Ukraine. The country has offered to help Russia in terms of manpower and also shells and rockets. When the UN condemned Russia's invasion of Ukraine at the start of the war, North Korea was one of the five nations that didn't sign the non-binding resolution of condemnation. The other countries were Russia, of course, Belarus, Syria, and Eritrea. In March 2023, North Korea boasted about its tactical nuclear weapons that could be fitted on short-range missiles and fired into South Korea. The country even simulated nuclear attacks on Seoul. We should add that we can't know if the country's nuclear capabilities are what it says they are, but who would want to second guess? North Korea's nuclear arsenal is a bit of a mystery, but tests have shown the country's nukes could certainly reach Japan and South Korea. The RAND Corporation projects that by 2027, North Korea will have stockpiled around 200 nuclear weapons, similar to the number that France and the UK have. Countries will discuss soon. We also know that North Korea has very powerful intercontinental ballistic missiles, which in theory could strike about as far as the US mainland. While the country is dirt poor, it has the world's fourth largest military and about 1.2 million personnel. It might also have a stock of highly dangerous chemical and biological weapons. If there's a world war, North Korea might soon swoop down into South Korea. Sure, the South would receive help, but that doesn't mean it'll be a safe place to live if hostilities kick off. The North, where so many people live in poverty and where infrastructure is plainly terrible, would also suffer tremendously. Again, we aren't going to guess how this would work out, but we'll just say we wouldn't want to be in either of these countries if the planet was eclipsed by war. Number 7. Neither would we want to be in Taiwan, which would very likely soon lose its independence after a successful Chinese attack. In the recent Pentagon leaks that told us Ukraine was struggling to get a spring offensive together, we also could see that US intelligence believes China would soon have air superiority over Taiwan in such an attack. Xi Jinping often boasts about the strength and modernization of the People's Liberation Army of China, which is said to be 14 times bigger than Taiwan's forces. Taiwan would struggle to hold off China, but anyway, in the event of World War III, it's just probably not where you want to be, even if it could hold off China. This next country would also struggle with China. Number 6. China and Japan have a long and complicated history. In the Second World War, Japan did things inside China that rivaled Hitler's atrocities in Europe. 
During China's so-called 100 Years of Humiliation, Japan surprised the European powers when it was victorious against China in the First Sino War. China had been the world's superpower for centuries, and yet it failed to modernize its military, and slowly but surely its power waned during the era. Since that time, China said many times never again, hence it's updated its military and Japan can feel the heat. No surprise then that Japan is very friendly with the US and other Western powers right now. After World War II, Japan was reduced to a shadow of its former military prowess, but these days, its defense capabilities have been bolstered. The country also has very close ties with the US and Europe. In 2022, Japan signed defense agreements with the US, Australia, and the UK. These countries together condemned Russia. That year, Japan announced a huge increase in military spending, which will see its military strength vastly improving over the next decade. In fact, Western media outlets talked about Japan gearing up for war with China what Bloomberg called a revolution in Japanese statecraft. The Japanese Prime Minister is not happy about China's activity in the Taiwan Strait. He recently warned that East Asia might end up looking like Ukraine in the near future. Such words could have been written by the US president's speechwriters. It's no surprise at all, given Japan's history with China, that the nation has thrown its sword into the ring with the West. Given what we've just said about North Korea, an attack by North Korea and China together would certainly cause a mess in Japan comparable to the mess the US caused almost 80 years ago. As you know, Japan's destruction involved a lot of intense bombing raids prior to the nukes, and it never backed down. Had those nukes not been dropped, Japan would very likely have fought off a land invasion with every last person throwing everything they had at the US. The devastation would have been absolutely terrible. It's estimated that there would have been between 1.7 to 4 million US casualties anywhere from 400 to 800,000 US dead, and between 5 to 10 million Japanese deaths. What does that tell you about Japanese resilience? It wouldn't bow down to China in a new war, but China does have a much better military, and unlike Japan, it has nuclear weapons. So no, we wouldn't want to be in Japan for World War III. Number 5. What about the UK? A country that undoubtedly used to rule the waves when its empire literally stretched all over the world. This tiny island, three times smaller than Texas, could fit inside of 11 different US states. It used to be like an empire on steroids, bolstered by baked beans, strong tea, and fish finger buddies. No, we're kidding about that last part, but Britain does have quite an exceptional military history. Napoleon failed against the Brits, and the Nazis also failed, mainly because attacking Britain by land would have been an uphill task for any country. How things have changed. The UK is also a shadow of its former self where the military is concerned. It would be vulnerable in World War III, but it would have to go on the attack. Britain is the US's closest ally, even closer than Canada, that's right next door. The US's other closest allies are Germany, Japan, and South Korea. The UK has the smallest stock of nuclear warheads out of China, France, Russia, the UK, and the US. It's believed Britain could have about 260, of which maybe 120 are operationally ready for deployment on the UK's four Vanguard-class nuclear-powered ballistic missile subs. Only one of them is currently at sea, carrying 40 warheads. The UK calls this its continuous at-sea deterrent. Britain still has a very strong military even though the days of empire building are a distant dream. Even so, it's arguably a top five military behind India, China, Russia, and the US, at least according to global firepower. In a world war scenario, it would still be almost impossible to invade by land, but no one would try that. Russia, which we'll discuss very soon, has the largest nuclear arsenal in the world. It has at least 15 bases from where it could launch a nuclear strike at the UK. If you've picked up a British tabloid newspaper or looked online at tabloid news over the last few years, these fear-inducing media outlets would have told you that Putin has nuclear weapons that could cause giant 1,000-foot-high tsunamis to hit Britain, which would possibly create a nuclear holocaust on the island. You sometimes have to take the tabloids with a pinch of salt. But there is no doubt that they have a point about massive nuclear missiles launched from one of Russia's submarines being able to wreak havoc on such a small and densely populated nation. A strike on London with its 9 million people, a center of finance and culture, would be devastating. There are large industrial centers in the north, not too far from each other, some being Manchester, Liverpool, Leeds, and Sheffield. The nuclear fallout would quickly penetrate these cities. There aren't too many places you could go in Britain to escape from the doom. 46% of its food is imported, many people would go hungry. This is far from a self-sufficient nation. It would not fare well at all in a world war. But unlike these next nations, at least it's hard to invade. Number 4. Many other countries in Europe, those currently in the EU, are not as impregnable as Britain. 
France, one of those countries, is another nuclear power with around 300 nuclear warheads, most of which are submarine-launched ballistic missiles. It also has nuclear-capable cruise missiles for its fighter aircraft. France has four nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines, as well as 40 Rafale BF-3 land-based aircraft and 10 Rafale MF-3s carrying nuclear warheads. France maintains a strict sufficiency policy, which means its nuclear weapons should only be used in extreme circumstances when its safety and security are threatened. But let's face it, if nuclear weapons really start to fly, we don't know how countries would react. Screw the policies, they might think, when they see noxious mushroom clouds hanging over cities like murderous mythological beasts. All countries have various policies about their nukes, but sometimes they are purposefully ambiguous. No one knows what'll happen if the world's nuclear powers went to war. The United States and Russia don't even have a no-first-use policy. Israel doesn't even admit to having nukes. As things stand, the nuclear world, you might say, is multipolar. When it was unipolar, the US thought about using them in China and later in Vietnam. Since other powers got them, we've had a stalemate. And once they start going off, mutually assured destruction will likely follow. While most of Europe supports Ukraine, different nations on the continent have thrown more or less effort into supporting Ukraine. The UK is obviously way more on the warpath than most other countries, but as we said, the UK usually does what the US wants it to do. France has much more independence, it's also bound by NATO's principles of collective defense, but we're not sure it would be as gung-ho about nuclear war as the US and the UK if Russia used nukes against Ukraine. It's hard to know how other European nations will feel about it and what they'll commit to and support. Germany, Poland, Estonia, and the Netherlands all have heavily supported Ukraine and many other nations offered their support. In contrast, nations such as Slovakia, Bulgaria, and Hungary, all in NATO, have different, less caustic attitudes towards Russia. Some politicians in Europe see the Ukraine war as a proxy war between Russia and the US, with Ukraine caught in the middle, but if this war escalates, we still don't really know what'll happen. What we do know is that another controversial war across Europe would be much more devastating than the wars at the start of the 20th century, just because the weapons we have today are so much more powerful. World War III would also be a much more technological war, with hacking digital infrastructure playing a big role. We just don't think being in the middle of this small continent would be a good place to be. But neither would a few thousand miles to the west. Number 3. The US, far from Europe, next to a good friend in Canada and a less conventional buddy in Mexico, would not have a threat on its borders. If World War III happened, though, there would be chaos in the US. There's no doubt about that. It could take many forms, maybe even organized crime outfits in Mexico, well armed as they already are, would cause havoc. The US is such a polarized nation too, so who knows what'll happen internally if it all goes off and the nukes land in the US. The US has an anti-nuclear weapon defense system, the ground-based mid-course defense, which would take out nuclear missiles, although when you hear such a task has been called, like trying to hit a bullet with a bullet, it doesn't exactly instill much trust. If there was an all-out nuclear war, the US would get hit. There is absolutely no doubt about that. In 2022, the American Physical Society released a 54-page report saying US defenses wouldn't even be able to stop the nukes from North Korea, never mind China or Russia. The report added that the US's current capabilities are low and will likely continue to be low for the next 15 years. No one knows which cities would be hit first, but it's likely New York, Chicago, Houston, Los Angeles, San Francisco, or Washington DC would all be contenders. These cities are not ready for a nuclear attack, according to various experts. One professor recently told the press, there isn't a single jurisdiction in America that has anything approaching an adequate plan to deal with a nuclear detonation. Not long ago, a public service announcement was released by New York City officials, in which a lady explained that the big one had hit. Her advice was go inside, stay away from the windows, and have a wash. She added, don't forget to watch TV and go online to catch up with what's going down outside. It's such a pity the residents of Hiroshima and Nagasaki didn't have that kind of information at their fingertips just before they were vaporized. A large nuke hitting New York would kill a large part of the city's population immediately. It could bring down the Empire State Building, Madison Square Garden, Penn Central Railroad Station, the New York Public Library. The blast wave would bring down more buildings. A 1,000-foot fireball would rage through the streets. Buildings would collapse further out as the thermal pulse obliterated humans. Maybe 300,000 would die in the next few seconds. As the blast was spread, hundreds of thousands of more people would die. Many would cling to life, but with mild to severe radiation sickness. Many of those would die over the next few days or weeks, horrible agonizing deaths. Maybe a million would die, and a million would suffer their injuries. 
New York would be in pieces, so yes, we doubt following that advice by going inside, laying on the couch with a cup of coffee in your hand, while surfing TV channels would be of much use. You can't wash off a 150 kiloton nuclear explosion. It's not like spilling wine on your new shirt. Many analysts say Russia now beats the US in terms of its nuclear arsenal. We'll talk about that soon, but for now, let's just say the US would get hit and hit badly. Millions would die in attacks, but the nuclear fallout would get many more as chaos reigned in the attacked cities and beyond. The weapon we used in our New York City scenario was 150 kilotons. It said Russia has nukes with yields of around 300 and 800 kilotons. The US has close to 5,400 nuclear warheads, with about 1,600 of them deployed. This includes 400 Minuteman III ICBMs and 450 operational launchers. These have a yield of between 170 to 335 kilotons. Numbers concerning deployed nukes, stockpiled nukes, and retired nukes are always changing. Just recently, a report said the U.S. has 1,419 deployed nuclear warheads. The U.S. would want to use them to prevent an attack on itself, so escalation would likely spin out of control very fast. The U.S.'s nuclear capabilities are diverse, with the country having 14 nuclear-capable Ohio-class Trident submarines, nine of which right now are in the Pacific and five in the Atlantic. The U.S. also has 60 nuclear-capable heavy bombers, 20 B-2 bombers, and 40 B-52s, as well as 240 UGM-133A Trident II D-5 submarine-launched ballistic missiles on 14 Ohio-class nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines. It said the U.S. has 800 delivery systems or thereabouts. Recent reports say the country is spending $1 billion on a new nuclear missile that will be able to travel 6,000 miles, carrying a warhead with a yield of around 300 kilotons. The plan is to make 600 of them over the next few years. And like with all big military powers, the U.S. will have a lot of firepower up its sleeves. If the country is hit with a nuclear weapon, we'll be looking at a possible nuclear holocaust on our planet. And all that talk you hear about the U.S. turning its back on biological and chemical weapons, you can be sure is just that, talk. The U.S. has always been a leader in this regard, even though it has often been keeping it top secret. It's a leader because it fears, rightly fears, China and Russia are developing their own horrifying biological and chemical weapons. The Cold War might have ended, but it's highly doubtful the biggest military powers have just given up research on such weapons. To be sure, the UN has said the United Nations is not aware of any biological weapons programs, but let's see what people say about that in 50 years. They will be horrified by the secret and nasty weapons the big powers are now developing, just as we're horrified about what the US and Soviet Union are doing decades ago. So, if the US were hit with a nuke, it would be, as the famous REM song says, the end of the world as we know it. But we would not feel fine. Number 2. As we told you, China will have its own secret biological weapons program, as will Russia. These two nations and the US would release biological and chemical hell. China also has nukes, maybe about 400 of them, although there's a lot of speculation about China's nukes. In 2023, Defense News reported, the US may no longer enjoy a numerical advantage against China in certain elements of its intercontinental ballistic missile program, according to Strategic Command, which oversees the US nuclear arsenal. It was said that China now has 300 intercontinental ballistic missiles and launchers, which is fewer than the US. However, the report noted that China's Dongfeng-41 missile can carry multiple warheads. So 300 missiles could get you slightly over 400 warheads. China also has short and medium range missiles, while China's in-class nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines can carry up to 12 submarine-launched ballistic missiles. On top of this, there is China's H-6N nuclear-capable bomber. The country's nuclear capabilities are said to be growing at a fast rate too. Not to mention China's other military strengths. It might not be a country with much military experience, but in terms of manpower and equipment, it's certainly a force to be reckoned with. China's navy, according to various US sources, will soon outgrow the US navy. But today we're mostly talking about where we wouldn't want to be, and China is one of those countries. Like the US, it would almost be impossible to invade China by land successfully. The country is pretty much the same size as the US and just as diverse in terms of terrain. Some say even more diverse. It would be a nightmare to invade China by land. So the war would turn nuclear, millions upon millions of Chinese people packed into its largest cities would die, and the nuclear fallout, not to mention the chaos caused by infrastructure damage and disruptions in trade, would cause hell on the so-called Middle Kingdom. At the same time, all the countries that rely on Chinese trade would suffer. Just imagine our New York City scenario, but with many millions more people. Now for the last one, which is pretty obvious. Number 1. 
The nations that would suffer the most are Ukraine and Russia. We're putting these countries together because they are currently at war with each other. Ukraine has already been invaded, but if things escalate, Russia could easily be invaded by a NATO force consisting of the militaries of many powerful European nations and, of course, the US. Unlike China and the US, Russia would likely become occupied. But before that happened, the Americans would launch a nuclear attack. Much of Russia is barely inhabited, so the attacks would concentrate on Moscow, home to 10% of Russia's entire population, at about 13 million, 21.5 million residents in the metropolitan area. St. Petersburg has a population of about 5 million. Much of Russia is controlled in these centers. Even though it's much bigger than the US, there is less to aim for in terms of big cities. Russia has around 5,400 nuclear weapons, with around 1,644 of them deployed. In the 1960s, it detonated the biggest nuclear bomb ever made, the Tsar Bomba, which was said to be 50 megatons and damaged buildings as far away as 500 miles. The force of the explosion was 1,500 times bigger than that of the bomb that hit Hiroshima. It doesn't have one of those now, but it does have some terrifying weapons of mass destruction. Its RS-28 Sarmats, long-range ballistic missiles, can carry up to 10 large nuclear warheads and travel 11,000 miles, and they are a force of nature. In 2023, Russia said 50 new Satan II RS-28 Sarmat SSX-30s would soon be ready for combat. Russia might have about 1,600 warheads deployed at missile and bomber bases and on submarines. About 2,900 more are active, making Russia the biggest hitter in terms of nuclear weapons, and it has six missile fields. Domborovsky, Kartale, Kozelsk, Taitysheva, Uzhur, and Alesk. Russia also has nuclear missile submarines patrolling the naval bases of Nepritsia, Yagilnaya, and Rabachi. Its nuclear bombers are stationed at Ukrainka and Engels air bases. Russia's cities might be destroyed, but its nukes would find their target. As we mentioned earlier, some of those are quite capable of killing hundreds of thousands or more people in just one strike, though it's thought some of them have a yield of around 500 kilotons, though Russia might have some in the 1,000 kiloton range, which is quite insane. The country has about 1,900 tactical nukes, 1,185 intercontinental ballistic missiles, 800 sub-launch ballistic missiles, and 580 air-launched warheads from bombers. Again, the numbers change depending on the source, because the exact number is guesswork. The first use of nukes would be in Ukraine, with smaller tactical nukes, possibly Russia's 9K720 Iskander missile system. These might not have the power of the bomb that hit Hiroshima, but these 5 kiloton bombs would still cause a lot of damage, and would spread radiation poisoning and radioactive debris all over the place. Tens of thousands of citizens have already died in Ukraine, not to mention military casualties that have likely been underreported for both Ukraine and Russia. You can only imagine the devastation in Ukraine if nukes were used. The country has already lost thousands of buildings, bridges, roads, and houses, costing perhaps 300 to 500 billion dollars. You wouldn't want to be in Ukraine right now, never mind if the war becomes World War III, and when that happens, you can be sure Russia would immediately be hit back. So you really wouldn't want to be in Russia either, especially not in the populated areas in European Russia. These two nations would be ground zero of the war, but if things escalated from there, the countries we've already mentioned would also be places you certainly wouldn't want to be. A recent Princeton simulation study concluded that if Russia and NATO did get into a nuclear war, hitting the 30 most populated centers with 5 to 10 nukes would result in about 34 million deaths within 45 minutes. Possibly another 57 million would be injured, millions with possibly fatal injuries. Seems like a low estimate to us, but what is certain is tens or even hundreds of millions will die in the next year from their injuries, sickness, or due to nuclear fallout, and as we said earlier, disruptions to trade and aid. Russia's few population centers would take a hammering. But so would many of our historic cities. Conventional war would follow, which would look like something from a dystopian movie as militaries try to finish people off among the radioactive rubble, people who never wanted war and had no beef with each other. A nuclear winter is possible, which would mean the collapse of civilization as we know it, and a little ice age lasting thousands of years. Let's just hope World War III doesn't happen. In terms of the Earth's resume, when there is an intergalactic planetary meeting at the center of the universe in the future, having mutually assured destruction in 2023 written in the experience section won't be a good look. 0032 hours, April 29, 2022. A massive Chinese fleet made up of several dozen destroyers, two aircraft carriers, and dozens of troop transport and landing dock ships push out from their rally point a few miles off the Chinese coast. Their destination? Taiwan and a forceful reunification of the breakaway country. Beneath the waves, an American Sea Wolf submarine sits and observes the situation. 
relaying a burst transmission to the rest of the American military via extreme low frequency communications. It's a Cold War relic, but still the quietest submarine in the world, and the Chinese subs hunting for American interceptors are much noisier than it. The burst transmission alerts the Chinese to its presence, but resting near the bottom of the Taiwanese Strait, the submarine is virtually invisible. The invasion warning reaches the top echelons of the US military within minutes. American President Joe Biden made it clear within months of taking office that he would defend the Taiwanese people and their democracy with military force if necessary. The Chinese invasion fleet has taken weeks to amass, and the US has had plenty of opportunity to make its own preparations. Spread out across the Pacific are three American carrier strike groups, each made up of just under 100 combat aircraft and escort vessels for the big carriers. On Guam, American bombers, drones, and fighter aircraft have been pre-positioned inside hardened bunkers, and US aircraft across South Korea, Japan, and the greater southeastern Pacific have long been on alert. But just as word is reaching the Oval Office that the Chinese are initiating their invasion of Taiwan, the United States is the first to come under attack. The United States and China both wield considerable counterforce power, and both know that the stakes for not striking first could mean a knockout blow before the war even begins. The US has prepared as best it could by moving aircraft into hardened facilities and dispersing its naval forces. But with an arsenal of hundreds of long and intermediate range missiles, the People's Liberation Army Rocket Force is the first to draw blood. 200 ballistic missiles rain down on American military installations in Japan, the Philippines, and Thailand. The strike has come as a complete surprise. Chinese anti-satellite weapons have blinded or hacked American recon satellites in orbit, meant to detect the thermal plumes of missile launches. Some of the missiles are aimed at specific targets such as radar and communications hubs, while others disperse cratering munitions to knock runways out of operations. Yet others shower down smaller warheads across a wide area, destroying or seriously damaging hundreds of American and Japanese aircraft. This bolt out of the blue is a modern-day Pearl Harbor, and it's only just begun. Next, the PLARF's intermediate-range ballistic missiles begin to rain down on American ships across the South Pacific. Two of the American carrier groups are in range of the strike, and despite a robust defense by fleet ballistic missile defense systems, one carrier takes two direct hits and is sunk. 5,500 American sailors are killed in a matter of seconds, the fastest mass loss of life in US military history. A second carrier survives the barrage, but is seriously damaged and considered a mission kill. Along with the loss of a dozen escort vessels, the United States has suffered the worst defeat in its military history and a financial loss of over $20 billion. Redundant systems mitigate the effects of Chinese anti-satellite attacks within minutes, allowing the United States military to get a clearer picture of the final phase of the ballistic missile Pearl Harbor it's currently enduring. The third wave of attacks come from China's 100 or so long-range ballistic missiles, which are targeted at bases in Australia, Guam, the US's most important Pacific base, and Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean. The advance warning of a few minutes allows a few alert aircraft to scream into the sky before they're destroyed on their pads, and the US missile defenses throw up a cloud of steel attempting to defend the most important American military installations in the world. But stopping a fire truck sized missile traveling many times the speed of sound is extremely difficult, and no nation in the world has ever mastered ballistic missile defenses. Runways, fuel depots, ammunition storage, and troop barracks are destroyed in seconds, with an additional 15,000 American airmen, sailors, and marines dying in the attacks. It's 45 minutes into World War III, and China has already expended half of its missile forces. It will hold the rest in reserve to threaten American vessels and make sure its invasion of Taiwan goes unopposed by the US. There's more at stake here than one island democracy, though. The very fate of the world in the 21st century hangs in the balance. A military defeat of the United States signals a new top dog on the world stage, and China is very eager to shape the world in its own authoritarian image. Chinese fighters based on artificial islands that the country has been illegally building in the South Pacific for over a decade ensure air dominance across the most vulnerable approaches of the invasion fleet. With two carriers out of the fight and dozens of long-range air defense missile batteries spread out across China's unsinkable island aircraft carriers, American air power can't hope to threaten the Chinese Navy from the south. The attack on Taiwan is only vulnerable from the north, but the thorough destruction on joint American and Japanese military bases has forced the two nations to base their surviving air forces from civilian airfields. These too come under sporadic attack. Though Japan's missile defense forces do a fair job of shooting down the older generation missiles China has left in its inventory. China may have launched attacks on Japanese soil, but it has purposefully avoided sending troops to disputed Senkaku Islands. This was a calculated move, as Japan still has a strong pacifist streak. 
The attacks on its military installations anger many Japanese, but the savagery of the great missile attack in history has intimidated much of the Japanese people. If China is able to so thoroughly decimate the nation's military airfields, what could it do against its population centers? Its textbook American Shock and Awe, only this time used against its own friends. The Japanese Prime Minister meets with his cabinet to make an important decision. Will Japan join the US in its war against China? While the US is treaty-bound to defend Japan in case of attacks, the reverse is not true, and the situation looks grim. Much of US firepower in the Pacific has either been destroyed or seriously degraded. Diego Garcia and Guam are out of commission, leaving the US with few staging areas for an offensive against China. The loss of two of its carrier strike groups has reduced American firepower in the region by as much as 30%. Even with reinforcements from Central and European Command, there's simply few places the United States can stage a counter-strike against the Chinese from. And China still has hundreds of medium-range missiles along with over a thousand short-range ones. Japan has made its decision. It will not join the US in its fight against China. Further, to avoid an expansion of missile strikes on its own shores, Japan forbids the US from launching combat operations from airfields on its sovereign soil. American installations on Japan may be used for humanitarian purposes, but American combat aircraft cannot fly from the island nation to strike at Chinese forces. The loss of Japanese support is crippling for America's ability to fight the Chinese. While the US has encircled China with military installations, China has countered the US presence with a network of anti-air and anti-ship defenses. Known as Anti-Access Area Denial or A2AD, the network's Chinese defenses have made it extremely hazardous for American ships or aircraft to come within hundreds of miles of Chinese forces. The US is not completely helpless though and American submarine forces devastate the Chinese Navy over the coming days. China's anti-submarine warfare capabilities are severely lacking, and US subs are deadly quiet. However, losses mount over time, and with no surface vessels to exploit the losses inflicted by US submarines, the effort fails to turn the tide of the invasion of Taiwan. Chinese invasion forces are further devastated by American standoff attack weapons launched from a variety of long-range aircraft. A flurry of anti-ship and ground strike missiles pound Chinese forces, inflicting great losses. However, Taiwan is less than a day from a heavily militarized Chinese coast, and replenishing even the grievous losses incurred by the invasion is relatively simple without the US surface navy to threaten the effort. International outrage against China burns red hot, but the nation is much of the world's greatest trading partner. With 1.4 billion potential customers, corporations from around the world have made gaining access to Chinese markets a top priority for decades. Now, the massive economic clout wielded by China helps deflect much of the world's anger. While many condemn China for its invasion, nobody but the UK and Australia are willing to back up their words with military action. However, without the US Navy's support, there is little that even a joint fleet can do to break through the tough Chinese defenses in the South Pacific. The US may have been knocked out of the Pacific, but it is by no means defeated. Over the coming weeks, the largest naval battle group in American history is assembled off the coast of California pulling together vessels from across American global commands. It's a concentration of firepower unseen in world history, and while losses will be extraordinarily high in the face of the Chinese A2AD defenses, the fleet is determined to break into the first island chain and to try to relieve the pressure on Taiwan. By now, though, Chinese forces have occupied much of the small island nation. The Taiwanese have put up a fierce defense of their island, and Chinese losses have been astronomical. Without US naval and air power to seriously threaten the invasion forces replenishment and resupply operations though, the unending tidal wave of manpower from mainland China has overwhelmed Taiwan's defenders. The resistance has fallen back to the central mountains, where heavy cover gives some protection from China's complete air superiority. Most of Taiwan's heavy equipment, including tanks, field artillery, and attack helicopters, has been destroyed by now. And while a guerrilla resistance could rage for years, China is in effect in control of the island. Hunted down by Chinese special forces, the Taiwanese president is forced to concede and accepts China's reunification of the island. Without US support, there is no point in continuing the bloodshed. Over 100,000 Taiwanese have been killed or seriously injured, inflicting four times that number on the Chinese invaders. But defeat is inevitable, and under threat of more violence from China, the Taiwanese president surrenders. The United States is shocked by the sudden surrender. China has now completely secured the first island chain past its naval borders, and it quickly turns Taiwan into an island fortress. The American attack will now have to break through even tougher defenses than before, but the death blow to the US war plans comes with Taiwan's official surrender. Whatever international support the US had going into the war, it has quickly lost. The matter of Taiwan has been officially and violently resolved, and nobody feels like joining the US in the massive loss of life it will take to restore Taiwanese independence.
especially not with the equally massive hit to global trade that will come from full-scale war between the US and China. China quickly sues for peace between itself and the US. The two nations are not evenly matched in terms of military power. While China maintains an advantage in the Pacific, the US military still outmatches its own. The longer the war goes on, the greater the disparity in losses will be between the two powers, with China inevitably suffering a complete military defeat. The US not only has the superior forces, but also the superior tactical position as it's able to shut down almost all of Chinese overseas trade which means a massive reduction in Chinese GDP as high as 35%. It is in China's best interest to end the war quickly, and with the reunification of Taiwan and world opinion turning against further violence, the US is forced to accept a ceasefire. The overwhelming bolt-out-of-the-blue attack on US forces in the Pacific, the loss of the Japanese support, and the swift surrender of Taiwan have all worked to strategically defeat the United States. It has not suffered a military defeat, but in the end, China has accomplished all of its strategic goals in the region and the world now knows that Asia and the Pacific, the most economically important region in the world, belongs to it. The United States has just lost the third and shortest of world wars, a defeat that signals to many that China's rising dragon will be the one to shape the world for the century to come. The date is November 2, 2021. The world economy has at last begun to recover from the coronavirus outbreak. But as nations begin to open up again, one country is determined to reshape the new world order in its own image. For three weeks, China has been building its forces for a cross-strait invasion into Taiwan. Given its still limited mobility fleet and extreme currents of the Strait of Taiwan, China has a very narrow window to secure a beachhead only twice a year, and the Chinese Communist Party is no longer willing to wait for a peaceful reunification. In response to the military buildup, the United States has responded in kind, moving a sizable portion of its Atlantic fleet to the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Bases in Hawaii, Australia, Alaska, and Japan all bustle with activity as thousands of aircraft are shuttled to airfields closer to the potential conflict zone. Guam, linchpin of the US operations in South Pacific, is on full alert. At 0124 hours, China launches the first salvo of World War III. Overhead, American spy satellites pick up the unmistakable thermal plumes of hundreds of ballistic missiles, lifting off launch vehicles, and silos all across eastern China. Much of these missiles smash into neighboring Taiwan, but a number of them reach space and then readjust their trajectories. Guided by Chinese satellites and ground control stations, Chinese DF-26 ballistic missiles, otherwise known as Guam killers, perform course correction burns before re-entering the atmosphere, packing a warhead loaded with over 3,000 pounds of explosives. Each missile is a deadly threat to a target on the ground. American Aegis cruisers immediately launch volleys of ballistic missile interceptors, seeking to destroy the Chinese missiles while still outside the atmosphere. American THAAD, or Terminal High Altitude Area Defense Unit stationed in both South Korea and Guam, send their own volleys of interceptors. But the DF-26 missiles carry countermeasures and scatter radar-confusing chafe and decoys as they cruise just outside of the atmosphere and prepare to enter their terminal phase. American interceptors destroy many missiles, but many more slip past the first layer of defense. Now entering the atmosphere, Patriot missile defense batteries stationed on Guam fire interceptors in droves. More missiles are killed, but just half a minute later, over a dozen DF-26 missiles prepare for impact. Four of the missiles split open, showering American runways with runway cratering munitions. The rest smash into important fuel and munition storage facilities, or strike at barracks and plane hangars. The DF-26 missiles aren't exactly precise. They have a target radius of just under 100 meters, but with over 3,000 pounds of explosives, they don't need to be. In seconds, Guam is a smoking ruin, and a significant portion of US Pacific military might has just been neutralized. Out at sea, however, the DF-26 targeting American carrier strike groups don't fare as well. If China is going to have any chance of winning the war, the American carriers need to be destroyed and have been secondary in priority only to Guam. The American carriers have been sailing at full steam, though, and performing erratic maneuvers. The two powerful nuclear reactors aboard the Nimitz carriers push the massive ships to top speeds that have to this day remained classified, easily outrunning their escorts, but for their erratic maneuvers meant to throw off the D-26's targeting. The strike group's defenses open up on the big missiles, with its accompanying cruisers firing off volley after volley of interceptors. Most of the DF-26s are downed, but a near-miss cripples the Ronald Reagan and forces it to return to the American West Coast for extensive repairs. A direct hit on the bow of the Abraham Lincoln devastates the massive carrier. Within two hours, the giant ship and its accompanying 80 combat aircraft and thousands of sailors are all lying at the bottom of the sea. 
the US has just suffered more casualties in the first three hours of World War III than in 20 years of fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. Now it's America's turn to strike back. Chinese missile strikes have devastated American and allied nation bases across the Pacific, from Guam to Japan, and as far south as Australia. America's first counterattack doesn't come from a kinetic weapon, but from an electronic one. Malicious code lurking in Chinese computer systems for years comes to life with a single keystroke, and suddenly Chinese communications and intelligence networks are brought to a screeching halt. China is shocked at the electronic devastation of the attack and at the lackluster performance of what it had hoped would be a digital Pearl Harbor against the US. Chinese government hackers are only just now discovering that the computer systems they've been painstakingly penetrating over the course of years have largely been simulated. Anticipating a massive cyber attack in the case of war, the US has spoofed many of its own critical military computer networks and allowed foreign powers to believe their software was penetrating real networks being used by real people. These fake networks are so detailed that they even simulate individual workers' browsing history. Chinese hackers can watch as personnel waste time on YouTube and playing their favorite Flash games, yet it's all fake, simulated by AI. But the electronic attack is quickly followed by a very real kinetic attack. On the long-range radar, Chinese air defense installations watch American B-2 bombers on approach. The stealthy planes can't evade radar completely, and intermittent contacts betray their presence while still hundreds of miles from the Chinese coast. However, knowing the stealth bombers are somewhere out there and getting a target lock is a totally different thing, and high-frequency targeting radars can't resolve a good lock on the incredibly stealthy bombers. Featuring upgraded stealth composites and an exhaust system that cools the hot air of the twin turbojets powering the big bombers, the B-2s penetrate even deeper toward Chinese territory. Fighter jets are scrambled to intercept the attack craft, but while still hundreds of miles away, the B-2s let loose with their payloads. Each B-2 briefly flashes brightly on the radar as its cargo bay doors are opened and then quickly closed, restoring its stealth characteristics. Then, the big planes turn around and head for surviving friendly airfields. From the belly of each plane, half a dozen large missiles fall toward the Pacific Ocean. Rocket engines come to life as the missiles fall to just a few hundred feet off the waves, and each missile levels off at just over 50 feet over the breaking waves. The missiles feature stealthy characteristics, making them very difficult to track and target with interceptors, and terrain-following radar allows them to skim just above the waves so as to remain under the horizon of Chinese radar. As the missiles accelerate to twice the speed of sound, the rocket engines suddenly cut off and are jettisoned, and the missile's main mode of propulsion, a scramjet, flares to life. The scramjet has no moving parts and works by compressing incoming air from the nose of the missile and injecting fuel into the superheated air, which instantly ignites. However, each missile has to be helped along to supersonic speed before the scramjets can engage. But once they do, the missiles punch forward until they're moving at thousands of miles an hour. The missiles arrive at their targets across the Chinese coast. They roar over population centers to reach military buildup zones, air bases, and command and control nodes. Upon reaching their targets, the missiles suddenly plunge to the ground, causing only minor destruction on impact. However, for miles around each missile's final descent, all electronics have been permanently disabled. The US has just crippled thousands of Chinese vehicles, command and control nodes, ships, aircraft, and computers with electromagnetic pulse weapons. Not a single Chinese soldier has died in the attack, but immeasurable damage has been done to Chinese logistics and military infrastructure. A few days later, the surface war to push the US out of the Pacific has finally began in earnest. Chinese Type 055 and 052 destroyers are punching well above their weight class against American ships. The Chinese destroyers are newer than their American counterparts, many of which have begun to show their age. The Type 55 and 52s are fast, precise, and lethal with their arsenal of anti-ship cruise missiles and inflict heavy losses on American ships. They're supported by a range of bases built across the South China Sea, each one of which is home to dozens of missile batteries, combat aircraft, and long-range surveillance radar. Despite its carrier strike groups largely intact, the US can't penetrate the outer ring of Chinese Pacific defenses without a dedicated concentration of firepower. Until the South China Sea artificial reef bases are neutralized, it'll be weeks before the US Navy can bring the fight to China's shores. In the meantime, speedy and agile Chinese destroyers seek out US and allied ships that stray too close. Supported by aircraft flying out of the reclaimed island bases China has spent two decades building while the world just watched. 
Under the waves, however, the United States has let loose its fleet of terrifying underwater predators. American attack submarines have been more prepared for this fight than the rest of the US Navy. Pre-positioned along critical waterways for months at a time thanks to their nuclear reactors, which provide them with unlimited endurance. It's only the crew's need to eat that limits the sub's endurance, but a whole fleet of fast resupply vessels keeps America's silent service well supplied at war, and the deadly sub's back on target. American Virginia and Los Angeles-class submarines have begun hunting Chinese subs since the war began. By far, their most difficult prey is the stealthy Type 39A a submarine so advanced it caught U.S. intelligence completely by surprise. The advantage, however, remains firmly on the U.S. side, as China's anti-submarine warfare capabilities continue to lag significantly behind the U.S. Lacking air and surface assets to hunt down American subs, the quiet nuclear-powered subs methodically search for the Chinese diesel-electric subs. After losing three subs to the American fleet, the Chinese have ordered their own subs close to support bases. The Chinese sub's main mission, after all, is to attack American surface ships, and they're still being kept at bay by the massive People's Liberation Army rocket force. However, this leaves the U.S. silent service free to hunt across the South Pacific, and dozens of Chinese ships are either sunk or crippled in attacks. Some American subs are lost, but the Virginia-class subs prove even more difficult to locate and sink than Los Angeles-class featuring a new generation of noise-canceling rubber tiles and equipment built with tolerances tighter than even spacecraft. The Virginia-class submarines are deadly predators and send many People's Liberation Army Navy ships to the bottom of the ocean. The war, however, remains at an impasse at the moment. Until China's South China Sea bases can be neutralized, the U.S. can't bring its own considerable naval and air power to bear, let alone begin the reconquest and liberation of Taiwan. What has become extremely clear to both sides, however, is that the most important weapons of what will become World War III are for the first time in history exclusively weapons that operate in the cyber, space, and naval warfighting realms. What would borders look like after World War III? The First and Second World Wars reshuffled borders around the world, but nowhere more significantly than in Europe. After World War I, many countries had their borders reorganized, largely to punish Germany. And in the aftermath of World War II, the tug of war between the two empires, led by the United States and the Soviet Union, treated the continent like a game of risk, dividing up territory between their two blocs and even carving Germany into two with a big wall in the middle, and some countries like Prussia ceased to exist altogether. And if it happened again, things would likely be just as thorny, but maybe not just in Europe. First up, let's look at the tail of the tape. We don't know if or how World War III will break out, but we can assume who will be on what side. The main forces on one side will likely be led by the United States along with its allies in NATO, including Canada, the United Kingdom, France, and just about all of the European Union. They'll be joined by the West's Asian allies, including Japan, South Korea, India, and Taiwan. In the Middle East, Israel and Saudi Arabia will likely staunchly be on this side as well, although financial and security concerns may cause them to take a more low-key role. And while they might be far from the action, Australia and New Zealand will likely be aligned with this bloc as well. The other side may be smaller in number, but it'll have some real powerhouses. The odds-on favorite for lighting the match that'll burn into World War III is probably Russia, whose invasion of Ukraine has kicked off a massive regional war and whose belligerent actions and comments toward NATO have everyone afraid of escalation. They're largely isolated diplomatically and economically, but that wouldn't be the case if it turns into a larger conflict. While China has backed away from reflexively supporting the war on Ukraine in recent months, the two countries see themselves as the alliance against US domination of the world, and any World War III would likely see those two great powers in firm accord. They would be joined by a few powerful countries, including the nuclear powers of North Korea and likely Pakistan, whose bitter rivalry with India would likely tilt them toward China's side. Nuclear power wannabe Iran has been one of Russia's staunchest supporters in the current war, and they'll likely pick up a few other allies around the world, like Belarus, Syria, and Venezuela. And when these two blocs go to war, it's almost guaranteed to leave a different world in its wake. There are two questions about World War III that will determine what the world looks like in the aftermath. The first is if nuclear weapons wind up being used. While Putin threatens to use nuclear weapons about every 10 minutes, the fact is no country has used them in combat since 1945. Everyone is very hesitant to take the first shot that could lead to a world-ending exchange of missiles. All of the US, Russia, and China likely have the nuclear arsenal to create the threat of mutually assured destruction. If a missile gets fired off and it leads to a larger nuclear exchange, then it's possible there would be no borders at all in certain countries, or all of them, because they would 
would no longer exist. While a full nuclear exchange between the largest countries might be less likely, a more limited nuclear exchange between rivals like India and Pakistan could be more likely. But even if Earth avoids nuclear annihilation, there are a lot of questions to answer. For one thing, who wins the war? This would obviously change the outcome of the borders. Like the past world wars, the side with the United States is the heavy favorite. They have the most state-of-the-art military equipment, the larger nuclear arsenal, the most powerful aircraft carriers, and the stronger economic connections. It's highly unlikely that the United States and NATO could be defeated on the battlefield, but their biggest enemy might be themselves. The likely hope for Russia and China's bloc is to wear down their enemy until the war loses support, and for the American bloc to eventually just withdraw from the war like they did in Vietnam. If they did that, Russia and China would likely have relatively free reign. Putin would likely get his wish of reincorporating Ukraine, and then would set his sights on the other countries that gained independence in the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union both in Europe and in Central Asia. He would begin with countries that aren't a part of NATO, but there's no guarantee he'd stop there. It's likely that a full invasion of NATO territory would kick off a new conflict, so it might be more likely that he would satisfy himself with restoring the country's former glory. But this might just be the calm before the storm. As the odds are, the war would kick off again soon enough. The same might go for Asia. China has one big goal ever since it started saber-rattling decades ago, taking over the island nation of Taiwan and turning it into a Chinese possession. This is as much a point of pride as anything else for China, and it would likely be the initial attack they made in a larger war. Other countries in China's immediate vicinity might be in danger too, particularly Vietnam, Japan, and South Korea. However, this would likely only happen in the unlikely event of a total victory where the United States' forces are defeated, so it's more likely that in a negotiated settlement, China would be taking over parts of other countries. They would likely use this opportunity to claim back more Himalayan territory from India and establish a permanent claim to the South China Sea. The most likely countries for them to take over in full might be some of the small island nations in the Pacific, which could become major beachheads in the Pacific War. But it's far more likely this would go the other way. Most analysts believe that the United States and NATO bloc has far superior firepower and organization to the Russia-China bloc, and that any conflict that didn't escalate to full nuclear exchange would likely go in their favor. The main question is whether Russia and China are able to withdraw from the conflict gracefully or take it to the bitter end. That would play a big role in whether the borders of the world are dramatically reshuffled or not. If Russia and China are allowed to avoid the embarrassment of a full surrender, the odds are good they might be allowed to slink away with what they had before the war, if not what they're actually holding at its conclusion. It's all about which side wants peace more and what they're willing to give for it. First, let's take a look at which areas aren't likely to see their borders change. Possibly the safest place in the world to be during World War III is South America, and odds are good that this continent might be left out of it altogether. Most of South American countries are led by mainstream left-wing leaders, and while some of them have made controversial pro-Putin comments, almost all have good diplomatic and economic relations with the US. Also, none of them have militaries meant for global warfare and are likely to take an isolationist approach to the war. The one exception is Venezuela, led by fiery autocrat Nicolas Maduro, although his rule is contested by an ongoing power struggle, and his rival Juan Guaido is recognized by many countries. Maduro is held onto power by force so far. While Maduro is considered a solidly a Putin ally and an enemy of the US, he doesn't have much firepower and isn't likely to send his small military halfway across the world to aid his allies. With no direct involvement in the war, the victors are likely to let Maduro's Venezuela just continue to be South America's resident crazy uncle, and the situation's probably similar to the North. Unlike South America, North America is going to be directly involved in the war, with two NATO members taking up the majority of its land area. But it's also far away from the likely major fronts in the war, two massive oceans away to be exact. During the First World Wars, the United States only saw a few attacks off its coasts and most famously in Hawaii. Today, missiles make it much easier to strike around the world, but being able to strike the US doesn't make it any easier to conquer. Both the US and Canada are massive, and would likely be the last countries targeted for invasion. Then there's Mexico, and while the US's southern neighbor has tense relations at times, it's not likely to go against it in a war. There will be no repeat of the Zimmerman telegram here, so North America is likely to remain in the status quo. And another continent gets to breathe a sigh of relief. The borders of Africa were largely drawn by colonial powers over the last few centuries, and many of the countries didn't even gain their independence until the mid-20th century. Today, many of them are still developing their economies after centuries of having their fates determined by outside powers, and as such aren't seen as global military powers. 
They are, however, becoming a hub for economic development. Due to mistrust of the Western powers, many are cutting economic deals with China, but it's likely none would have the military reach or the desire to join the war on their side. While it is possible China's presence in these states, particularly Djibouti, where China has a military state, could pull Africa in more directly, it's unlikely that redrawing any borders in Africa would be a priority for the winners. The changes would be concentrated everywhere else, and they could be massive. Across the world, there might be smaller conflicts that would boil over in the middle of World War III, and each one would likely end with some significant changes to the world's borders. Probably the least significant would be a potential clash between India and Pakistan, concentrated in the Kashmir region. It's likely India would be aligned with the US and NATO while Pakistan is aligned with China, but it's not guaranteed that either party would get directly involved in the larger war. However, the two countries are on the verge of conflict in the best of times. So, a shooting war between them could break out in times of enhanced global conflict. But how much would this change on the ground? Odds are that at the end of the war, assuming neither country had been thoroughly defeated, which is unlikely, given that both are major regional nuclear powers, the victors of the war would lean heavily on India and Pakistan to settle the conflict via a peace treaty once and for all. While India's faction wouldn't be likely to win the war, it doesn't mean India would necessarily win this skirmish. And even if they did, that doesn't necessarily mean that they would get everything they wanted out of the deal. The world would likely be more concerned with settling the conflict for good, and that would mean finding a deal both sides could sign, even if no one was happy with it. But would either country want to take more than just Kashmir? It's unlikely as, unlike other countries with long-standing conflicts, India and Pakistan don't lay claim to one another. Quite the opposite, in fact, they're glad to be rid of each other. The partition of India and later the partition of Pakistan that led to the creation of Bangladesh were bloody affairs intended to fend off far worse bloodshed. Today, Pakistan is almost entirely Muslim while India has a strong Hindu majority, and neither country wants to turn back the clock and become a massive melting pot again, no matter who is in charge. So any border changes here are likely to be focused on security issues and border regions. The same can't be said for other conflicts. It's one of the most intractable conflicts in the world, the ongoing Cold War and occasionally hot war between Israel and its Arab and Muslim neighbors. Since 1948, there have been multiple wars aimed at destroying the Israeli experiment. All have failed and over decades, Israel has made peace or at least coexistence agreements with many of them. Egypt and Jordan are now unlikely to participate in any attack against Israel, but the same can be said for Israel's northern neighbor, Syria. Not only is it still run by a ruthless enemy of Israel, Bashar al-Assad, but Israel still possesses a section of Syria it claimed after the 1967 war, the Golan Heights. And Israel is about to get a new government, featuring its former right-wing leader who is now backed up by far-right coalition partners, meaning relations could deteriorate with all its neighbors. And there's another element that could make this conflict boil over in a hurry. Syria is involved in a brutal civil war, with Russia backing Assad's regime. This means Russian troops are present in Syria, and largely keep the militant groups from shooting down at Israeli territory. It's a key reason why Israel has been hesitant to contribute too much to Ukraine's defense, for fear of Putin unleashing his forces in retaliation. But they might not have that choice in a larger war. If Putin uses Syria to launch a proxy war on Israel, Israel's likely to give the okay for retaliatory strikes and maybe a full invasion of Syria. The same might happen with the Hezbollah-controlled Lebanon next door, where border skirmishes are common. This is a small-scale conflict, and unless Russia or its regional ally Iran decides to get directly involved, Israel is likely to win decisively, and that could mean a major change in the Middle East. Israel has been pushed to give back much of the land it took from surrounding countries in the past wars, such as the Sinai Peninsula to Egypt, but it always came through one circumstance – peace deals. Without any such deal with Syria, it has steadfastly held on to the Golan Heights for security reasons, and it's likely a new conflict would mean taking more mountain regions from Syria and Lebanon. While this isn't likely to get Israel into a new occupation quagmire like other war claims it made after the 1967 war, it could significantly increase the small country's territory and lead it to becoming more of a regional power. But in another country, it could be all or nothing. The Korean Peninsula is a tale of two countries divided since the Korean War. While it started as a military dictatorship, today capitalist South Korea is a thriving democracy with a rich tech and entertainment sector and close relations with the United States. 
It would be a key part of the Asian front along with Japan and Taiwan. Meanwhile, to the north, North Korea is still under the same clan of communist rulers that took control of the country, and much of the country lives in extreme poverty. It's closely aligned with China, although even the Chinese Communist Party tends to view the Kim clan as unpredictable wildcards. The difference is never starker than when looking at a lighting map of the two countries. And after 70 years, the two Koreas are no closer to peace. In fact, neither country even acknowledges the other as a legitimate country. Both claim to be the rightful ruler of the entire Korean peninsula. And while an armistice has held until now, nuclear-armed North Korea continues to provoke its neighbors. It's entirely possible that a shooting war could begin between the two countries amid World War III. It is unlikely that South Korea would start the war, and it's also not clear if China would want North Korea to make a move on its southern neighbor. But Kim Jong-un might just see the world going to war and decide there's no better chance to make his move. And in a full conflict between the Koreas, there's only one major question. Would North Korea pull the trigger on nuclear weapons? If it targets Seoul, odds are strong that Seoul's allies would target Pyongyang with everything they had in retaliation. That could leave both Koreas a wasteland and leave the entire peninsula as valuable real estate for its neighbor China. But if it remains a conventional war, odds are it'll still be a long and bloody one. The two countries have amongst the biggest armies per capita in the world thanks to extensive conscription, and if it goes on long enough, it's likely both countries' allies would get into the conflict. But is a unified Korea even possible? It's unlikely, because the systems of government are so radically different that it would be near impossible to incorporate them. North Korea would never be able to subjugate all of South Korea's population after decades of freedom, except in the case where its faction had essentially taken over the world. And while South Korea talks a big game about North Korea being a part of its territory, it's not clear if they're up to the task of taking in tens of millions of citizens who've been raised in a cult-like environment with absolute loyalty to their leader. In fact, the most likely solution to the conflict might come from a third party. Odds are, China would be watching the conflict carefully, encouraging and funding their North Korean allies, but making sure they don't go too far. And if it looks like Kim Jong-un is about to become the first person to use nuclear weapons in the conflict, Chinese troops could easily launch a sneak attack from the north, decapitate the North Korean regime, and take control of the area in the name of stabilizing the situation, and expand their territory while mostly being seen as a savior. Of course, then it might only be a matter of time before they start making noise about the reunification of Chinese Korea. But China might have a much bigger concern at the end of the war. Just about every country that loses a war winds up seeing the victors take the spoils, but things might not be so simple with China. China is likely to be seen as the secondary aggressor in the conflict, and its participation is likely to be limited to Asia and the Pacific. An invasion of China would be incredibly difficult due to China's massive population and challenging terrain, and would also be the most likely cause of China using nuclear weapons. So it's likely when dealing with China, the American-aligned bloc would be satisfied with getting a cessation of hostilities and some modest concessions. But that doesn't mean China wouldn't have some bitter pills to swallow. The first wouldn't actually affect China's borders, at least not the borders that are officially acknowledged. It would probably have to give up claims to Taiwan and any territories it seized in the South China Sea and the Pacific. With the United States strongly backing Taiwan in the war and the island nation being so key to the world's tech infrastructure, it would likely wind up in a similar situation to Japan and South Korea, a US ally where it had personal protection of the United States to guarantee its continued independence. But China might face some deeper cuts. Depending on how thoroughly it lost the war and how many concessions it was forced to make, it might be ordered to allow for independence for several contested regions. This might include the provinces of formerly British Hong Kong, which has bitterly resisted the harsh imposition of CCP rule in recent years, or the wealthy business hub of Macau. More significantly, it might be forced to give up some border regions to India as part of the peace deal or allow for independence or self-determination for the region of East Turkestan, also known as Xinjiang. This area, largely populated by the Uyghur Muslim minority, has seen brutal oppression by the Chinese government in recent years. However, both this and the large region of Tibet, which was annexed by China decades ago, might be a bridge too far for China to agree to, and the victorious coalition might be forced to let China's borders remain largely intact or threaten the delicate peace. But it isn't the same case for another aggressor in the conflict. Much like Germany during World War II, a defeated Russia is likely to face far deeper cuts than its ally to the east. It is likely that Russia would be only defeated once Vladimir Putin is removed from office by any means necessary, be it the NATO coalition or his own people. He's proven that he's willing to burn through Russia's military stockpile to get Ukraine, and it might be too obsessed to stop. But a new leader might be willing to cut Russia's losses and rebuild. But that doesn't mean that the NATO forces would be willing to go easy. 
because Europe's borders are likely to change a lot in the aftermath. The most significant changes might be outside of Russia. Odds are, nations like Ukraine and other former Eastern Bloc states would be stampeding to join NATO and the EU, seeking the protection of a larger power. Russia, who threatened invasion of any country on its border that joined, would likely be powerless to stop them this time. At the very least, Russia would find itself confined to its current borders and surrounded by countries that wanted nothing to do with it. And if the EU decided to shift from being a loose confederation to being a more cohesive nation, they could potentially become the largest country by land area in the world. Another blow to Russia's reputation. Heck, even the UK might look across the channel and think it wanted to be part of the party again. But Russia might face harsher cuts than that. The best case scenario for Russia after losing the war is that it would be reduced to all the territory it had before the war in Ukraine began, and that might be generous. Ukraine's president has insisted there won't be any deal that allows Russia to keep captured territory, including Crimea, seized before the war. This is a key access route for Russia, and they'll likely fight hard to keep it. But if they're at the point of surrender, they might have no choice. But the stakes could be much higher for Russia. Could the end of the war lead to the collapse of Russia? It's unlikely as long as the war ends with a stable Russian government intact. It is certain that they'll be working to hold on to every bit of territory they can, but this may be easier said than done, since Russia is home to dozens of ethnic groups, each with its own cultural region and its own independence movement. A weakened Russian government would see these movements step up efforts to gain autonomy, and the West would likely not be interested in helping them resist it. In a worst-case scenario, Russia could see a continuation of the collapse of the Soviet Union, and the propaganda map created by Russia to show the threats facing it could become a reality due to its military adventurism. But in the end, most country borders are likely to stay intact. Several continents won't be directly involved in World War III, and many of those that are would not see their borders change significantly. While the losers of the war would see dramatic changes on the border, few will see anything as dramatic as the aftermath of the world wars. Of course, this is all dependent on everyone staying calm and keeping their fingers off the nuclear trigger. A big if. Thanks again to our sponsor, Conflict of Nations, the free online PvP strategy game happening in a modern global warfare. Get a special gift of 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free by using the link. It's only available for 30 days, so don't wait. Choose your country and start fighting your way to victory right now. Want to learn more about what would happen if World War III breaks out? Check out What Would Happen After World War III or watch U.S. nuclear weapons ready to launch for World War III for the worst-case scenario.